good afternoon and welcome to Brands Hatch for the penultimate round of the British GT Championship of 2019. And I'll tell you what, we may be looking for cars and drivers, but we're not looking for people. This grid is absolutely rammed. There is such a bound of excitement going on at the moment for two reasons. Both GT3 and GT4 titles could, could be sewn up here this weekend. It's a long shot, but it could be done. And I'll tell you what, we haven't seen the championship won with rounds to spare since 2015 when Jamie Chadwick and Ross Gunn did it in GT4, of course. Look how well they've both gone on to thrive in their racing careers. Now, what can I tell you about today, apart from the fact that there is a lot of excitement and quite a, quite a bit of tension among the drivers. I've chatted to many of them this morning. And there's a lot of nail biting going on. Brands Hatch, of course, is a phenomenal venue. We love coming here. But what about the weather? Because that's something that's causing a lot of the teams some question marks. According to all the apps you can find, there's a 7% chance of rain. However, the clouds above belie that stat. There is a chance with 120 minutes of racing that we might have a little bit of a wash of the track as well. Who knows? I'll tell you who might know, actually, is our gurus up at the comms box. Uh, I know that during the race, we will have the wonderful Joe Osborne adding his fabulous flavor. And I know so many of you, because I've read some of the comments, think that he's a wonderful addition to the team and he's very welcome. But of course, the voice of the championship, Mr. Andy McEwen, I reckon is also a bit of a rain dancer. And if anyone's going to know whether we're going to get some wet, it will be him. I will be back with you as soon as I can. I'm basically waiting for some driving talent to come out here because there's so many stories up and down this grid. So as soon as they show up, I'll start chatting to them. Meanwhile, Andy McEwen, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Andy Joe. Well, being a northerner, I've seen uh, a bit of rain in my time. I don't think it's going to rain, personally, right now. But as you say, this is a two-hour race, this penultimate round of the 2019 British GT Championship. So anything can happen, and more than likely will. The Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit has always produced dramatic races, and especially in latter years, as it's been one of the last few rounds of the championship, traditionally, uh, it's tended to throw up the odd surprise and the odd twist, and we've had plenty of them already this year. But yeah, Andy's absolutely right, we could in theory, see both the GT3 and the GT4 titles wrapped up this weekend, in fact, wrapped up in about two hours' time. The only way that that can happen, though, is if the number 69 Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini of Johnny Cocker and Sam Dehan wins the race. They must win the race in order to have any chance of wrapping up the title before we go to Donington Park next time. And then, of course, there's the usual mix of uh, other uh, permutations that have to unfold as well. Well, Andy, as we know, is down on the grid. Thankfully, he's got cars and, indeed, drivers with him now, I believe. He's with Rob Bell. That's right. One of the first drivers out on the track, you would uh, assume, is so keen because they're sitting on pole. We've got Rob Bell here. Rob, this is a, a very nice moment for you. First pole for the team for a long time. Yeah, I believe so. You know, we've got um, the 720S, the new McLaren, uh, which we've been working with all year. And we're, we're just starting to understand it, really. We, we always knew it was going to be that case, you know, and... Um, we're just finding our feet and really enjoying it now and the car's coming alive. I mean, you guys are doing very, very well. I believe the statistics are something along the lines of the best point scorers over the last four rounds. Mm. You've really started to look sharp in the car and no success penalty? Not not for today, which is uh, which is nice. Um, yeah, someone else told me that uh, statistic, which I wasn't aware of. But look, I think it just shows, firstly, it's a competitive championship and to be at the sharp end is fantastic. And, uh, you know, we've got we've got work to do. It's going to be a tough day at the office today, I'm sure. But, um, you know, we're, we're getting there and, and more importantly, enjoying it. And uh, Sean loves the car and he, he's driving better than ever. So, you know, that's uh, that's a good thing. I know you pros never feel any pressure, but I'm going to give you one more stat because I'm trying to increase the pressure on you just a mite. And that is that the last five endurance races in British GT have been won from pole. Yeah, absolutely. No You're going to make it six out of six? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. We look forward to seeing how you get on. Right. Good luck to you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Um, right. Now, I'm trying to see if, uh, if Johnny Cock is available. It doesn't look like he's here yet. Hang on. I'm just looking around. I'm going to wade down just to see. Let's, because Sam Dehan and Johnny Cocker, they are a very interesting story. They've got a chance. A very good chance. Oh, there he is. They've got a very good chance of winning it. Well, I say good chance. They have to win here today in order to sew up the title. Can they do it? The team looked very hungry, but then you could kind of say that about everyone, couldn't we? Let's go straight in with Johnny and let's ask the main man. Hey, Johnny, how are you doing? The main man. Uh, the Hi, main man. Let's <laughs> let's go with that. Johnny, you've got to be feeling a fair bit of pressure today because of what this could mean if you win the... Ch well, if you win here, yeah. you could claim the crown couldn't you yeah i think uh, yeah, obviously i think we you have to take every race as it comes um 
I think obviously the championship's always in the back of the mind, um, but we know what we need to do here today. Um, I think we've got the pace to win the race. Um, that's the aim. Whatever happens around and behind us is out of our control, really, to be quite honest. So we're just going to do everything we can to do that. And um, yeah, let's let's just try and get as many points today as possible, and um, and hopefully make it an easy ride for Donington or. If this plus this plus this happens, yeah, technically we can win today. But I think, you know, my head's just in the car and just doing the best job I can. I mean, the variables around who you need not to do so well in order to win the title are kind of in your favour, aren't they? If you look at who it is, the teams behind you that have got a chance of blocking you out haven't been doing too well over the last few rounds. So really for you, it's about getting in front of one and two and winning it, isn't it? Yeah, I think Sam, you know, Sam's our kind of weapon in that respect. I mean, obviously anybody who's watching the races can see that the pro session generally kind of calms down in the race. There's not an awful lot of overtaking, generally speaking. Um, and the AM session is uh, the first half of the race. That's where it can all be kind of won or lost, really. So Sam knows what he needs to do. Um, he's got loads of pace. Um, and he, we've got a car which is we knew was never really going to be quite right on the pace in terms of qualifying, ultimate pace. But in the race, we've got a car which is going to look after the tyres and uh, I expect that we're going to be strong in the second half of this stint. So. That's the maths. Let's talk about the betting. If yeah. you were a betting man, are you taking the title today? All in, yeah. Let's yeah. go for it. <laughs> I love it. Always bet on black and, well, and kind of greeny yellow, I guess. Yeah, no, I think, you know, anything can happen. You know, these races tend to always throw something up in the air. But I think, you know, we've, we've got a good car. We both know what we need to do today. Um, and like I say, anything that happens around or behind us is outside of our control. So we just got to get our heads down and just crack on with it, really. Can you do me a favor? Can you make it unbelievably exciting for us? I'd rather it was as boring as possible, really. To be well, that means it. you don't get past two people. So, you know, you've at least <laughs> got to get past like the front two. Sam leads from the start. We have a nice 20 second gap when I get in the car and I just cruise around for an hour. That'd be lovely. <laughs> Well, let's not go for that. Let's go for the fun option, yeah? Right, okay. But enjoy yourself, all yeah, right? Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Uh, OK, we've got to hot foot it down to GT4. So um, you know that's a long way by now because we've done this throughout the season. I'm going to throw back to Andy and we'll be back with you as fast as we can. It's a long way because it's a big grid of cars, isn't it? And that's one of the great things about the British GT Championship these days. It is very, very well supported both by the fans and by the teams and drivers out on the track. Let's talk GT4 then, because in GT4, again, the same applies. If the championship leading number 15 Multimatic Motorsport for the Mustang of Scott Maxwell and Seb Prio wins the race today, they could be the champions, but they must win. So both GT3 and GT4 have to be won by the current points leaders in order for the title to be decided before we go to Donington Park. That's why this is possible, but perhaps not all that likely to happen. But they are only five points ahead of the uh, number five, uh, Tom and Motorsport McLaren of Jordan Collard and Lewis Proctor. Uh, and that car is starting some way down the order, down on about the seventh row of the GT4 grid. That possibly will open the door for a few others, in particular the 97 TF Sport car that uh, won last time at Spa in dramatic fashion after contact with the uh, other Tolman car, the number four machine, on the start of the final lap of the race. And they came home the winners. They've moved into third in the championship now, um, and they are second on the grid, whilst the championship leading car uh, is also down on about the sixth or seventh row. So it's uh, rather a jumbled order in GT4, and it's guaranteed, Andy J, to provide us with plenty of drama over the next two hours. I'm very pleased to say I, I'm not at GT4 yet because every now and again you have to stop on the run when you spot a famous face and well, I've managed to find a legend. Oh, World champion, Olympic silver medalist. I thought he was gold and he corrected me. It's, it's the one I know, you and Thomas. How are you doing, bud? Good, thanks. Really excited, actually, yeah. yeah. It's brilliant. Just the buzz around, everything. It's cool. I mean, you're no stranger to obviously... Well, I mean, you, you like a run and a jump, don't you? But you love a fast car too, right? Yeah. I've got a Bentley myself as well, so I've been invited down here today with Orbital, and I just thought to see Seb and Rick, you know, it's just, uh, I think only when you see a sport close up in the flesh, you can appreciate how skillful those sportsmen and women are. And I think, you know, even seeing the guys during warm-up this morning, they're driving some powerful cars here and a lot of skill involved and bravery. So, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Join the dots for me here, Ewan, because the last time we had an Olympic medalist come and watch, invited to come and watch. Sir Chris Hoy. Sir Chris Hoy. Oh, okay. He turned out to race for us. Are we going to see you in this car next year? I'd have to definitely lose at least 10 kilograms, I think. But no, I'd love a chance to race one of these cars, yeah. But I'm um, not sure I've got the skill set. I'd, I'd try, though. I'd give it a go. I mean, I, I want to see that happen. Have you got your odds? I haven't, no. 
No, you've got you've got I've time. Got, I've got I mean, to get that. How long does it take to get my license and so forth? Well, you need you'd need some medals as well. You need enough points, but you could right. get your odds reasonably quickly. Right, got I'm to right. learn some flags. Got to be proficient around the track and not mess up. You could you could do that in a week. On it, two weeks maybe. Love it. Brilliant. Good luck. Thanks Thank for you. talking Thank to us. You. Brilliant. Um, right, we are now going to do our best. Hey, Seb. Good luck, mate. Um, we're going to do our best to get down to GT4. The uh, the horn has gone, but I reckon we can do it. Here we go. Let's run. Uh, you can either stay with us or not. Cameraman Mark's thinking, no, let's throw so we can we can be wobbly. Um, <laughs> let's go, Mark. Let's see what we can do. Right, now where is the front of GT4? You see, you can get a chance to see just how big this grid actually is. We always talk about you shouldn't come with us on the run. That's mostly because of my fitness levels uh, and you get to see my fat back. But it does have the does have the, the tracks on it, which we're very proud of. Where is the front of GT4? Here we go. Aha! Sounding like Alan Partridge now. How are you yeah, doing? You all right? Good, <laughs> good, 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 good. How are you feeling? Because this is, I mean, this is a fabulous place to be Poland, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah, second year in a row as well, so it's something special, so I must be all right around here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that later. What are your chances? Are you thinking this is going to be lights to flag, or do you reckon with 120 minutes, all sorts of crazy is going to happen? Oh, I think it's, uh, it's it's all going to kick off, isn't it? Um, it's, never, it's always an exciting one here. It was exciting last year. Um, I'm not expecting our lights to fly. I'm not expecting it to be easy. It's never easy, is it? Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping for not the result at the end. Um, that we've got here, so I hope we're on the top step. Well, looking at your timings at Spa, you were absolutely barnstorming. I think you were the fastest quality by some margin. So we know that you've got hot laps in you. You reckon the car's going to handle it well around here? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's managed by all year, and I don't see why I can't now. So, yeah, I'm feeling confident about it. This is full-blown fighting talk. Yeah, it is, yeah. I'm Scottish, you know. <laughs> <laughs> good for you, love it. Listen, good luck. Obviously, we're going to get kicked off the grid very shortly, but he's in the right frame of mind. Yeah, yeah, he's done an amazing job all weekend. and well, I think both of us are a little bit nervous just now, but I'm sure he'll be fine. He's been fighting all year, so no reason he can't be now. Let's see here. Get on. Good luck. Thank Enjoy you, yourself. Thank you. Take yeah. care. Have That's a good great. one. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Brilliant. Um, guys, as you can see, we, uh, as per usual, getting kicked off, but I reckon we're set up for a fantastic race. This is... It's so loaded with incidents and implements and subplots. Can we seal the titles, GT3 and GT4? It's unlikely, but this is British GT where anything can happen. So enjoy the race. We'll bring you as much as we can from the pits whenever we can. Thanks, Andy. Great work, as always, down on the pit lane to dig out the stories, which he'll continue to do for the next two hours. And plenty of stories there will be, I think. And the pit lane will be a really significant uh, part of this race because the Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit is not the easiest of circuits to overtake on. So pit strategy, good pit stops, they are key. You can't have a single fumble in the pit lane or on the track, in the traffic, that's always a factor as well. The GT3 cars within a handful of laps will catch the GT4 pack and because it's so narrow and because it's so technical a circuit, it's not always easy to get past even the GT4 cars and that can lead to excitement as well. So this is gonna be a full-on couple of hours of entertainment and, and 12 months ago it was a fantastic race we saw um, Johnny Cocker and Sam Dehan robbed of the chance to win their first ever race in British GT together um, in the final five minutes they lost the lead in GT3 so we're expecting a similarly close contest again today there is the championship leading car in GT3 then Johnny Cocker and Sam Dehan they're half a point ahead of their teammate car the number 72 of Adam Ballon and Phil Keane uh, so that is very close but on the grid, actually, the 72 car is all the way down in ninth, whereas the 69 is third on the grid. So advantage so far with the championship leading car. The optimum car number 96 that lines up on the outside of row one, they are third in the championship, but have a 20 second success penalty to serve because they won at Spa two weeks ago. Fourth in the championship is the car that lines up fourth on the grid. Number 47, Johnny Adam and Graham Davidson. They're some way back, but they're mathematically still in contention. The winners from Donington Park earlier on this year. They should have been on the podium at Spa, but a brake issue in the closing stages meant that they dropped down and finished eighth in the end. Uh, had they finished on the podium, they would have been at least third, maybe second in the championship arriving Brands Hatch, uh, at Brands Hatch, and they may well be ruining that when we get to Donington Park at the end of the year. So the grid has been cleared, the noise starts to build, the cars then are being led off onto their green flag lap now, ahead of the penultimate round of the 2019 championship, and it's a McLaren on pole position in both classes then, the Bulf Motorsport car on pole position in GT3, doesn't look like it's firing up because the green flag's been waved, and now, finally, off he goes, but then the Optimum car gets a bit left behind. That was a slightly scrappy start to the green flag lap, but they are all away now. 
And uh, yes, the uh, McLaren then on pole in both classes. And last year, Bath Motorsport did win the GT4 category. So uh, McLarens seem to go well here. The Brand Hatch Grand Prix circuit does seem to suit the mid-engined cars, which hasn't necessarily been the case at the most recent tracks we've visited. Here's the grid then. Sean Balfe will start the number 22 McLaren from pole position with winners last time, Optima Motorsport alongside Ollie Wilkinson at the wheel. Sam Dehan is third for Barwell. TF Sports Graham Davidson is fourth on the grid. Then it's Angus Fender in the silver BMW, the number nine car with Ian Loggie's Ram Racing Mercedes alongside. Row four for Rick Parfit in the JRM Racing Bentley and Dominic Paul in the second of the century BMWs that showed good speed in qualifying yesterday. Adam Ballon second in the championship, ninth on the grid with Team Park Racing's Bentley of Glengetty, 10th. 11th place then is uh, Michael Igo and 12th for Richard Neary. Uh, then on the seventh row, Mark Farmer, who had a spin in warm-up, brought out a red flag in the warm-up session earlier on today. He starts down in 13th with Andrew Howard making a welcome return in the Beach Dean car 14. Then the lead GT4 car, Callum Poynton for HHC Motorsport, Third in the, uh, fourth in the championship, needs a good result here if he can get one. Calvin Fletcher is leading the Pro-Am category in GT4. He's got Josh Smith alongside him on row number two. Then we've got Nick Jones and Patrick Matheson in the Optimum Motorsport uh, GT4. Aston Martin, Richard Williams in the Audi, he's qualified well. He's 21st overall with Josh Price alongside in the second of the uh, bright yellow TF Sport Aston Martins. Alex Toth Jones and Scott Maxwell, championship leader. There he is on screen in GT4 with work to do. Then it's Mark Kimber and Andrew Gordon Colbrook, the two Century Motorsport BMWs are together on the grid. Ahead of Ruben Del Sartre's HHC Motorsport McLaren and Mark Murphitt in the Fox Motorsport. Mercedes getting there now towards the back end of the grid. Then it's Lewis Proctor. He's got to try and make some ground as well. Remember that car second in the championship. He's got Steve McCulley in the Jaguar alongside him. And Ben Hurst and Richard Meaden in the second of the Multimatic cars. They have a five second pit stop penalty to serve because of a new driver lineup. Then it's Jack Butel with Graham Johnson alongside, winner here 12 months ago. And then right towards the back of the grid, then Mike McCollum in the KTM Crossbow, Chris Carr in the GT Marks Porsche, and the rest. Uh, that is it, in fact, that is the back row of the grid. So we're ready to go racing then. Two hours here in the British GT Championship, the penultimate round of the season. We'll get underway now. Away they go, contact already for TF Sports, Aston Martin in GT4. That was a really, really bunched up start to the race and already one of the potential race winners in GT4 is in stride. It's Optimal Motorsport though that lead the ranks in GT3. Graham Davidson goes around the outside of Sean Ball for second place and tries to make it an Aston Martin 1-2, which he might just be able to do right around the outside through Druids. That gives him the inside Side line down to Graham Hill and they are still side by side, but Davidson has the inside line and will move into second place. Third for Balfe, fourth is Dahan, and then fifth position for the Century Motorsport BMW of Angus Fender. All the GT3 cars are cleanly through Graham Hill and there is the 72 Lamborghini, the Barwell Motorsport car started by Adam Ballon. The last we saw of him, he was in the wall at Blanchimont at Spa and out of the race, the first non finish of the season for Barwell Motorsport. Well, a very, very dramatic start to the two hours of racing. Still side by side action and another place lost there for Sam Dahan. He's down to fifth position. But the main thing was that he managed to stay out of trouble. Well, I'd like to say that Joe Osborne has joined me now up in the comms box as there's contact there from uh, Glyn Getty onto the back of uh, Dominic Paul's BMW. I think Glyn uh, actually will end up losing a spot to the uh, JRM Bentley of Rick Parfit. Nice move there by Parfit as the uh, two Bentley swap positions. Right, Joe Osborne, <laughs> two hours. You'd think it was a five minute sprint race, wouldn't you? The way that that started. Chaos in GT4 already, but it's a narrow track and that always was a concern, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think it was a particular Slow starts um, as we've seen near. He's already get down the inside of Ballon there. The racing is hard and fast, so it's going to be hard to call, I think, for the first few laps. But just look like everyone bunched up at the, the front. The leaders continued the pace they wanted. And what you get with the GT4s being that sub grid behind is they're trying to get the jump before the lights go. And I don't know where the concertina happened, but obviously did big time there. And the TF car is actually pulled out. Uh, to the right-hand side after uh, after Graham Hill, you'll see it on the side. So that's their day done. Be interesting to know which car he hit because you see how much damage is on the front of his. You assume someone's got an equal amount of damage on the rear of theirs, but no one else seems to be having any issues. So hopefully that other car is okay. Unsurprisingly, the race start is under investigation. Now, that's not the most shocking piece of news we'll hear all day. We'll see whether any penalties come out of it, but certainly the 95 TF Sport Aston Martin, which it was. So good news for TF in a way, in that it wasn't their championship contending car, but still, they would have much rather had uh, both of their cars still in the race. 
So, breathe, everybody. That's only the first lap of racing done. And Ollie Wilkinson leads the way in GT3 from Graham Davidson second and Sean Ball third. In GT4, it is the 97 TF car then that leads the way now. So they have got themselves ahead of the HHC Motorsport McLaren. And so too, critically, has the number four uh, Tolman Motorsport a McLaren, uh, which was started by Josh Smith. And they should arguably have won the last couple of races and things just haven't really panned out the way that they'd have hoped. They were leading at the end of the penultimate lap last time out when they had contact from the car that's just overtaken them. Almost contact there between Graham Davidson and Sean Balfe as they fight over second position. They're allowing Wilkinson to pull away now. Wilkinson is a silver graded driver. These two are AM drivers, bronze graded drivers, and they're really doing battle. Balfe looking to the inside. He wants to get on with this. That McLaren's got good pace this weekend and he wants to try and get some clean air to really use that. Yeah, we've obviously seen a BOP change since our last round at Spa, which will affect where cars are strong. It looks like the McLaren's had a little bit more power given it to it. So we can see at the end of the straights, it's probably going to be that bit more competitive. The Aston, however, does look strong everywhere. Uh, Balf now in the 22 car has a hard decision. We have Fender behind, who's been in the GT4 category this year and stepping up for the first weekend in the GT3. So again, a silver car that's not really his battle, but could be a flying anointment to him getting the, the lead in the Pro-Am class the fight between him and Davidson in front. Meanwhile, Sam han has got Ian Loggy breathing down his neck as they turn through Hawthorne Corner, that really quick right-hander at the bottom of Pilgrim's drop. Dominic Paul now in the other century car that he's running in Pro-Am, but as you mentioned, because Angus Fender is now on board the number nine car, that's uh, been upgraded now to a silver, silver driver combo. So three silver cars in the GT3 ranks, which will have to carry a bit of extra success ballast as, uh, or a bit of extra ballast, anyway, not success ballast, but ballast in the cars as a result of that. This little group being caught by the two Pentleys now, which uh, we haven't really seen together on track that much because it's been a slightly lackluster season at times for both of these two cars. It's hard to imagine, isn't it, that that um, number 31 JRM Bentley of Rick Parford and Seb Morris won the opening race of the season at Alton Park. We all thought they were uh, on course to recreate their uh, championship winning form for a few years ago, but since then things haven't really fallen into place. But Glyn Geddy wants to get through here. He's looking up the inside. You can't fit two Bentleys into Druid side by side, especially when, when the one in front is uh, intent on closing the door. This is an interesting battle, but again, Glyn, a silver driver, needs to make progress, doesn't he? Yeah, we're seeing it at the front, obviously, uh, Wilkinson leading and being a silver car. That's where Glyn's going to get. And I think it's actually showing what a great job Rick Parfitt is doing against a semi-professional driver. He's a full and bronze driver. He's holding his own there. That battle is going to get worse and worse. Rick doesn't want to lose time, but Glyn needs to get past. So I see a flashpoint kicking off between those two Bentleys uh, in the not too distant future, I think. Which could be rather spectacular, definitely. The next car behind is Richard Neary. Then it's Adam Ballon. So Ballon is only 11th at the moment in the car that is second place in the GT3 Championship at the moment. Two Bentleys continue to circulate nose to tail. That must feel like a, a, an earthquake as those two cars blast past the spectators out on the Grand Prix circuit over the curbs. The cars bouncing around. Glingetti looking really, really eager to get through here, but the Grand Prix circuit is not, unless the car in front makes a mistake, it's not really the part of the track you want to be trying to make an overtake, is it? No, there's just not a big stop out there. So when you get out there, Hawthorne's first up, it's fifth gear down to third as we see the Fox car running wide. I think that'd be Rich Williams starting that car. Looked undamaged, hopefully he can get on his way. But yeah, the, the corners out there, Hawthorne's is fifth down to fourth or third, depending on the car. Westfield, fourth gear, Sterling, third, fourth. There's just not a big stop out there. So the overtaking really here has to be done at Druids and then probably onto the GP loop through um, through the corner onto the, the back straight is the, is the next one. But yeah, it's amazing when you watch round Brands. Actually, you appreciate, it looks like a great lap, a long flowing lap. It's our shortest lap of the year for British GT. So 37 cars on the grid. It's died down a little bit at the moment, but once we get these GT3 guys catching back up the GT4, the much more popular cars here today, there's going to be a lot of hard work and there's going to be a lot of time lost to these guys, like we saw at Spa, but more intensive, as you said, narrower to shorter lap, so cars don't have as much space, and that's normally a recipe for a bit of a disaster. Yes, especially since we're getting down to the business end of the season now, so when we get into the closing stages of this race, if there's another position and another few points on offer for one of our title contenders, they're going to go for it, regardless of which bat markers may be in the way. Here are your leaders in GT4, and they're in fourth position now in GT4, is Scott Maxwell. So he's had a really good start, didn't qualify too well that car, but uh, the championship leading Ford Mustang is into fourth now, ahead of one of the Century Motorsport cars, that is Andrew Gordon Colebrook in the number 43 example. 
that is the 57 car then that is fourth place in the championship now and they had that potentially very costly non-finish at uh, Spa last time out. They're 19 and a half points off the championship lead now. Callum Poynton starting the car. Dean McDonald, as we heard from earlier on, will take over. McLaren did well in qualifying, didn't they? But those TF Sport Aston Martins in GT4 in particular have really found some form in the second half of the year. Yeah, definitely. And we're seeing a very similar battle to what we saw at Spa between the TF Aston and the Tolman McLaren. Uh, we've got Hand in the car rather than Canning versus Smith, so the pairings have swapped. So it'll be interesting to see how that ebbs and flows. At Spa, we saw the Aston start off quicker, and then it's the last 20 minutes of that hour stint, the, the Tolman McLaren in that example started to close in. So maybe we'll see that trend as well. Not quite as hot as Spa here today. Slightly less tired deck uh, on the circuit as well than Spa. So we'll see how it flows. The GT3 cars are going to really start to work out where they are in the championship as well. We've seen Dehan and Cocker really start to get their head down and now take the, the lead of the championship. So it'll be interesting to see now how aggressive Dehan's going to be. For me, he's been probably the most aggressive slash impressive amp this year. So he's wondering how much Mark Lemmer at Barwell has got into his ear to say championship, championship, rather than, yeah, let's go and smash this, let's get a race win, let's look like heroes on the day. It's now getting to that, as you said, business end of the year where the big prize, the big trophy is more important than these little ones that get in the way of your uh, championship run. Well, Century Motorsport may not be championship contenders this year in either GT3 or GT4, but it's good to see the number nine car running well. Uh, in fact, both cars are in the top seven at the moment. Dominic Paul in the number three car rounds out that top seven as we speak. This, though, is the fight for second position. Graham Davidson and Sean Balfe, nose to tail. Rob Bell watching on from within the uh, Balfe Motorsport uh, garage and still winless so far this year are this pairing, but they've worked their way into seventh place in the championship now. They've had a couple of podium finishes mathematically they're still in contention for the title but it's a very 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 long shot they're just really out there to try and uh, get some good results now maybe get that elusive first victory the fact that they haven't won yet that means that they don't have a success penalty they were just off the podium last time out at spa so they may well start the race as one of the favorites but uh, this may well it's the fight for second right now but thinking ahead about 50 minutes this might become the fight for the race lead because we know that the 96 car has this 20 second success penalty so there's extra significance to this battle how much will that be in Sean Ball's mind that he wants to try and get through and, uh, and really get away from Davidson yeah so the silver car leading like we said has got that weight penalty 30 kilos and yes it's a subclass but the overall win means so much so even if you come second in in uh, overall but as first in pro-am you still i'm not going to leave here fully satisfied so it looks like to me bell's probably got a little bit of pace on davidson so the team will just be reminding him that the gap to p1 overall is just getting to five seconds so if we can breach that and that's going to make rob's job a lot easier than when brad gets in uh for wilkinson in, in that car and we saw at spa wilkinson did a perfect stint followed up by bradley ellis did a perfect stint and they won even with the silver extra weight the big thing for the silver combinations, both in GT3 and GT4, as soon as there is a safety car, that ruins their day. It really does. It gets rid of that there then. We're going to another onboard. This is my favorite onboard we've ever used, actually. So again, it's on board with the valve car uh, coming in onto the back straight. Looks like a little break, and he'll feed that throttle on all the way. And now it's the long, long run. So he's going to be on the throttle, down Pilgrim's drop. And unfortunately, the TV camera really does get rid of this. So we see how brave he is, how late and hard he breaks. So watch that middle pedal, how far it goes down. Middle way, bleeding off, back to throttle. And what he's doing there, that little jab on the throttle just settles the rear, puts the weight on the rear end of the car, gives it stability and traction so he can get on his way as quickly as possible. That camera's brilliant to see the driver. And actually, for an hour, I'd say Sean looks super relaxing there. His feet were moving in a nice methodical manner. There was no skitty nature we we'll see a very short break back to throttle and it might even jump over the curb there you can see his feet bouncing a bit as you smash the curb through sterling uh, and on the way to the finish uh, of the lap through clearway it's quite an easy corner to run wider the camera angle will show how close they run to the edge of the track all the way through um, you can see full throttle all the way down these cars traction control so sometimes it might look like he's a little unsmooth on the throttle but the traction control will limit how much power the car is actually giving to the rear wheels there. They are probably only a couple of laps away from catching the GT4 traffic as well now, so whilst he looks relatively calm and collected for the time being, he may not be in uh, five minutes' time or so. Back to GT4 then, and this is the fight uh, which involves the number 15 car then, so for fourth position within the GT4 category. And this is Scott Maxwell, Andrew Gordon-Colrook, 
and Jacob Matthiasen, isn't it, in the uh, 75, no, Patrick Matthiasen, I'll get that right at some point this year, Patrick Matthiasen in the 75, um, Aston Martin, those three running nose to tail, the leaders in GT4 though, starting now slightly to separate themselves a little bit, it's been a good start for the stint this from Ash Hand, he was 1.3 seconds clear of anybody else at the start of the lap, he is now one and a half seconds clear, so he's taken another tenth and a half or so out of Josh Smith's second, pointed in third, and then here the fight, fourth, fifth and sixth, makes its way down to Paddock Hill Bend. And uh, the Century Motorsport BMW is definitely benefiting a little bit this weekend. This circuit seems to suit this car, and it would be nice to see them on the podium. We haven't had a BMW on the podium yet all year long in either GT3 or GT4. Down the hill they go then, into Graham Hill Bend, and running a bit wide, that's easily done there, isn't it? That's a very steep downhill drop, and then all of a sudden it just flattens out at the apex, very easy to run wide and costly as well. Yeah, definitely, and uh, just a reminder of the regulations we run to here at British Championship to, to the Motorsport Association rather than FIA. So you cannot have any part of the wheel beyond the white line or a red and white curve in this instance here at Grand Hatch. So as soon as that wheel or tyre, sorry, touches the green, that is illegal, that's over the track limits. And Jonathan Palmer, to his wisdom here, has put pressure sensors in at various corners, Paddock Hill, uh, Turn 1. We've got Druids turn two and Graham Hill turn three. They've got pressure sensors. So as soon as you run wide, a picture's taken of your car and it goes straight to race control. And it's pretty hard to argue. It's literally black and white. Um, so I've tried my best and I've never found a way around it. Um, and those warnings will start to mount up. First three go unnoticed. Fourth is a black and white warning. And then the fifth will be a drive-through penalty or time added if it's towards the end of the race. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. We see an onboard here. It's a great chance to see the, the Brands Hatch circuit. The ups and the downs, Kelvin Fletcher, Pro-Am, Aston Martin with Beach Team behind one of the Tolman, McLaren's Lewis Proctor. But four cars in pretty close proximity here. Uh, and interestingly, you know, we've got three different brands across that. So we, we can see where they're going. And the onboard, you don't appreciate that Fletcher's got the HHC McLaren right up behind him as well. So although it looks like he's probably trying to overtake into Paddock there, he's actually defending, I would say, from the McLaren. So he's in that awkward predicament of attack, defend, and hold station all at once. So, yeah, he's going to have a, a very busy 45 minutes of his stint remaining, I would suggest. And again, Calvin Fletcher finds himself surrounded by silver-graded drivers. Remember, he is a bronze-graded AM. He's leading the AM Classic moment in the championship is Calvin Fletcher uh, with his co-driver, Martin Plowman, by half a point, which seems to be the standard, really, this year, over the Michael O'Brien and Graham Johnson, Bolt Motorsport and McLaren, who they are ahead of at the moment. Side-by-side side, out of 30s, and this is going to be a place lost, I think, for the Pro-Am leader, Nick Jones, about two places lost. Looked almost as if he decided, you know what, your silver drivers, I'm not really in your battle, and I'm going to let you through. That was sensible. It looks a bit like he just rolled over and let them through. But there was a reason for that, wasn't there? Yeah, I'd say you called it right. The team was suggesting. The problem is now we see the attack from Fletcher, and that is for class position. Pro Am Fletcher has now taken the lead of that class. So Nick Jones has kind of got a regroup here. He's already lost three positions on this lap, still has two GT4s in close proximity. So he yeah, has an amateur, it's so easy to lose that rhythm and suddenly it all unravels and your playing cards just fall flat and you've lost all your money. So he's now just got to take a deep breath. Nick's super calm, super professional in how he takes his approach to motorsport, but now he's got to dig deep and get back on the front foot. In the seven races we've had so far this year, Fletcher and Plough would have been on the uh, Pro-Am podium four times. That's uh, a win and a trio of second places as now joining in the fun is our fight for second place in GT3. It's still Davidson ahead of Bolt, but this was the point, wasn't it? They, they're battling each other, but it's also a battle just to avoid contact with the back markers. So if you're short Bolt now, there's no way that you can plan where you're going to try and attack Graham Davidson. You have to react instantly. If he fumbles amongst the back markers, you have to be on your toes to take advantage. Yeah, and even just to survive at that point, that was pretty larry. I mean, you're making a million decisions a second there, trying to second guess where that GT4 is going, where he wants you to go. And then you're, as you say, trying to capitalise on a mistake from someone in front of you. Uh, it's so easy to trip over a GT4 guy here. Everyone's got slightly different lines as we see Davidson run really deep. So he's potentially going to get a bad run onto the back straight. Again, he's going to be under pressure. I don't think Balfour will be able to capitalise on that but it does negate that time gap that there was there. Again, once they get to traffic, now Davidson's going to be on the back foot, having to work a bit harder to hopefully build that gap up in his way, whereas Balfour's obviously thinking the other way and he needs to try and get past him. They are both just starting to catch Wilkinson as well, and it's so hard to say if that's pace or traffic dependent at this, this moment in time. We haven't quite 
got the rhythm, the ebb and the flow of the, the pace of the, the leaders just yet. And 99% sure it's traffic because he was five seconds ahead about a lap and a half ago and now all of a sudden he's not. His last lap was a, a 31-2. I think the lap before that he was even slower. Just if you catch the back markers at the wrong point, particularly on the Grand Prix circuit, you sometimes have no choice but to sit behind them for a corner or two and that kills your lap time because of course through the high-speed corners, that's where the aerodynamics on the GT3 cars, that's where they make their lap time. And if you're stuck going at GT4 pace, you're going to lose seconds, not tenths of a second. Into paddock they go. Team manager for car 62, uh, the car being driven at the moment by Alex Toth Jones, seventh place in GT4, has been summoned to race control. Possibly part of that race start investigation that we saw uh, was ongoing. So all of a sudden, the top four GT3 cars are covered by just 3.4 seconds. The lead gap came down by another four tenths that time around. Ollie Wilkins is not having a good time in traffic. He's just been held up again by the 42 BMW. It's easy to get a bit dejected here for Ollie Wilkinson because you're probably seeing that your lead gap is shrinking almost by the corner. You have to have faith that the, the pendulum will swing back in your favour at some point. Right now, it isn't, though, is it? Yeah, I think you're probably too positive to a racing driver. Dejected is uh, <laughs> too positive as a word. It, anger is the one that hits you first. As you said, you lose seconds of time, and that is gone forever. There's no positive. You haven't saved the tyres. You haven't saved the brakes. So you need to try and dig deep and not lose any more. And then you want to get it back, and then that's where mistakes come. So that the anger, as I said, will come up, and you then need to realise you're angry and still go back to being calm. Every move needs to be methodical in out yes no as soon as you see these amps start to show the nose of their car a little bit of intent and then the gt4 car gets a little bit confused as we see someone go for a day at the beach on the yes exit of westfield you have to wait for the dust to settle looks like one of the academy gt4 cars oh, oh big wow, off that's for Getty. that is a huge off that's going to be a safety car at least uh that's the exit of westfield uh super fast corner fourth gear Hopefully Glynn's all right. The guys are going to have to really back off. We see Wilkinson spin through Paddock Hill. Car's going left and right of him. Oh. Looks like he's going to get away with that. We didn't see the cause of the spin, unfortunately, but he's now stuck in the middle of the road. So this half a lap's been pretty exciting. Still looking for the safety car boards. So it looks like Davidson has inherited the lead from Balfe. Wilkinson's got going again, but looks like he's going to be fifth once the dust settles. As we see Glynn Getty walking away. Awful for Glenn, but awful for those Team Parker guys. That car had an equally large crash at Brands Hatch, uh, sorry, at Spa, uh, last week in the 24 hours. So we get a replay. So it's all going to build up. Bentley's on the inside of the Aston. Oh, oh, that's hard from that angle. It looks like Glenn thinks he's clear of the car, and we see the impact there. It's huge, huge impact. And that's a re-profile corner, Westfield. It used to be even faster with even less runoff. So. Yeah, I mean, that car is destroyed, and that's less than a week ago. It was looking in a similar state, but the, the, the rear of the car, actually. So safety car's been called. Um, so everyone's going to bunch back up, but the GT4s are now going to be splitting those GT3s. So it's going to be interesting for the restart. We need to also have a look where the GT3 leader got to in comparison to the GT4 leader to see where the GT4 uh, guys will go a lap down or not, unfortunately. Uh, some of them will. I think there are maybe six or seven GT4 cars that have not been lapped yet, but everybody else has been. So you're right, that will split the pack in GT4 because the ones that haven't been lapped, they get to catch right back up to the back of the queue. The ones that have, unfortunately, are stuck. Yeah, and it's an unfortunate nature of the sport, and Peter Daly, the race director, will do everything in his power to try and get those GT4s back on the same lap to make it a fair fight. It's just the way the rules are, the safety car only picks up the GT3 leader. The GT4 is obviously just inherited as we see that damage. So that would have been from the rear left of the Getty Bentley just hitting that. So. Again, I, I don't want to make a snap judgment. It just looked like Glynn thought he was maybe clear of the 61 or he thought the 61 was going to give him a bit more space. And again, there was no malice on either side. So safety guys picking up the leaders here on the back straight. And the GT4 guys that we're focusing on on the cameras will just be able to catch up the safety car at natural speed. So they'll be going slowly, but still quick enough to catch it. As we see the beautiful McLaren 720 uh, safety car out there. Nice to have a capable safety car that's quick enough. So it'll wave through that. Academy GT4 car, pick up Davidson, who has suddenly inherited the lead uh, from almost nowhere. We didn't really see it. Brad Ellis speaking to Ollie Wilkinson, maybe finding out what happened in the spin, calming him back down, trying to work out why uh, why it happened to make sure it doesn't happen again. But, well, what an action-packed few minutes. <laughs> this is my first safety car, so I thought I'd been quite a good aim <laughs> omen for British GT, but unfortunately uh, not. So we're probably looking at a 10-minute uh, safety car. So just looking down 
Oh, on his own. Yeah, so no help. Didn't look like anything went particularly wrong in terms of it wasn't like a tank oh. slapper. The only thing I would say from that is maybe he's worried about running wide. And he's trying to keep the car tight so he's not going to get a track limit warning. And then all the energy just builds up, builds up, builds up and releases into a big spin. It looked like he probably stopped it from stalling how quickly he got away, but he would have been in fourth gear and the car won't pull away. So he would have been trying to get it all the way down to first. You could probably fudge it and get away in second, but we will, uh, we will see as we see a great onboard camera looking back from the diffuser of uh, Ballon's car, I believe. So Marshall's got a bit of work to do. That Bentley is not the smallest thing, so I'm sure that's punched a good hole in the tyre wall. We see some of the foam there really helps dissipate the energy. It's kind of a bit more of an advanced tyre wall. Um, so hopefully the Armco behind is OK. They don't need to replace any of the posts and we can just get it all sorted, Bentley back to the pit lane and, and get under racing. Well, let's unpack <laughs> what's happened then. Graham Davidson is leading and does not have any success penalty to serve. Sean Balfe is second and does not have a success penalty to serve. And Angus Fender is third and does not have a success penalty to serve. So that is a genuine fight now between those three cars for the lead of the race. And remember that Davidson, in the car that he shares with Johnny Adams, current race leader, they need a win, really, to keep themselves in contention for the title. So, so far, so good for the car that is fourth place in the championship coming into this weekend. Ollie Wilkinson, having spun, rejoined in fourth position, the 96 Aston Martin. Fifth place is where we have our championship leader, uh, Sam Dahan, who will now quite catch up, of course, to the car that won last time out. Sam uh, Ollie Wilkinson then in the 96 car, but down uh, in the pit lane is Bradley Ellis, and he's catching up with Andy Jay. Yeah, Bradley, that was, um, I mean, for him to recover and be in fourth position is not bad, is it? What were you saying to him? I'm assuming you had a chat on the radio. Uh, yeah, I was just chatting about trying to figure out what the problem is. We're not sure if it was we've had a bit of a tyre issue or if it was just a, a general driver mistake. So we've just been having a chat and obviously under safety car uh, situation, we're able to we'll see if I can get him to weave and, and get some feeling through the car and, and try and generate some understanding of... Um, you know of what the car's doing and just to make sure the car is okay um yeah it, it, super lucky i mean ollie had a mega start to the first stint so uh, yet to fully understand from ollie i haven't had a big conversation with him uh you came in halfway through the conversation but uh yeah i'm just trying to get an understanding I'm, I'm i'm hoping it's not the car uh if it's not the car and the car's fine then um you know we can still race from here that's uh, it's not an issue this is the unseen side of the, the pros in British GT, isn't it? You do a lot of chatting to, to the AMs and, and kind of keep them focused, keep them right. And I'm guessing, in, in this case, just kind of making sure that he's, he's settled and, and not shaken by that. Yeah, I mean, that is my main job role with Ollie. Uh, I've, you know, I've been with him right from the start of his career. And, you know, I'm just constantly ensuring that we're doing the right things at the right time. And even in race situations, I'm talking through what, what um, potentially we need to be doing next or what's just happened to try and progress faster. Frustrating for you, nonetheless. Uh, it's a little bit harder for me now, but I don't think the, the job the job isn't over. We you know we can we can definitely race from here. This is still looking good, so I'm not worried yet. I can talk to Sense yeah. once again. Happy days. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Now you said, Joe, earlier on that the worst thing that could happen for a silver car, particularly GT4, is that we get a safety car early on. Now, whilst the silver cars in GT3 don't have any extra time to serve in the penalty in pit stops due to being a silver silver drive combo, that particular one, the 96 car, did have this 20-second success penalty for the win at Spa. Now, he's obviously lost the lead anyway with the spin, but now the rest of the pack have caught up as well. So he is now likely, in about 32 minutes' time or so, when that car comes in, to rejoin the track further back than he would have done without the safety car. And it's another car that really needed to try and win or be on the podium in this race. So this is altogether not been a good 10 minutes for that team, has it? No, and there's there's no real way around it. And that's the, the beauty or the horrible nature of that success penalty. It really shakes the race up from the previous one. So they would have been on cloud nine at Spa. They couldn't have been any any happier. Lights to flag, lights to flag win. And now they've got a really, really problem. So I think we're going to get a replay at the start. So it'd be great if we can see what happened to the TF Aston GT4, if everyone looks at the back up high Ooh, so it looks like it's probably hit the optimum aston in the middle i think it, like i said earlier i think they've just gone for it uh tried to second guess the lights maybe have looked at the cars in front accelerate assumed it's going and then everyone's backed up and yeah it shows you how much energy even at that low speed how much damage can be done to that car unfortunately for tf uh, to have retirement that early on but there's no way that car is going to get repaired during a race so um, the eyes do the right right thing to get the car 
out of out of the way and unfortunately uh, that's their, their day done. It's been a torrid season really for the 95 car. They've only scored points in two of the seven races so far this year. But the most recent of those races was Spa last time when they finished third in GT4. So they've, their season was sort of starting to, to come good again. But uh, sadly for them and for Team Park Racing, it's not been a particularly pleasant afternoon so far. So the uh, Bentley needs recovering. The barrier needs uh, fixing. So let's, in the meantime, remind ourselves of what's happened in the first half hour of the race. It was a dramatic start for the 95 Aston Martin then with contact before the race had even started. And that was to set the tone rather. The first 10 minutes or so were fairly calm. But beyond that point, it has been mayhem, quite frankly. The 72 Lamborghini has been struggling. They're down in ninth place at the moment, and a bit of contact with uh, Michael Igo in the WPI uh, Lamborghini Huracan was not in the script either. In GT4, we had lots of action as well. The stellar performance Audi was tipped off the road by the 57 HHC Motorsport McLaren. And that uh, incident, I think, was under investigation last time I checked. And we had a change for the Pro-Am lead in GT4 when Calvin Fletcher got to the inside into Westfield. Speaking of Westfield, that was the scene of a big shunt for Glengetty that has brought out the safety car now. And at about the same sort of time, spin from the lead for Ollie Wilkinson on his own the team are hoping that it's not an issue with the car but certainly it's dropped them down to fourth position a moment that they could little afford especially given the fact they have this 20 second success penalty to serve in the pit stops so the safety car then out on track it will continue going for a couple more laps i think the pit lane window by the way um has changed slightly for this race usually it was 60 minutes in in a two-hour race that's when you can come in because the minimum driver time for each driver was 60 minutes. Now, though, uh, in GT3, it's 62 minutes. So the first driver has to do 62 minutes. So uh, when we've got 58 minutes left on the clock, that's when the pit lane window opens for GT3. In GT4, it's the other way around. It opens two minutes before the halfway mark. So after 58 minutes is when the uh, GT4 cars can come into the pit lane to serve their mandatory stop. Everyone has to come in. Everyone will change drivers. And in GT4, remember, the silver driver combos will have to uh, serve an extra uh, bit of time. I think it's an extra 20 seconds in the pit lane. So that will, uh, of course, jumble things up rather in GT4 and maybe play into the hands of some of the Pro-Am contenders. On board with Adam Ballon then, looking backwards. So he's down in ninth position. The 69 car's had all the speed this weekend, hasn't it? It's been a bit weird, really. The 72 car, which traditionally has gone quite well here, usually seems to have struggled a little bit. They're half a point behind the 69 machine, though. This has to be a fascinating dynamic now, with it being teammates at battle for the championship. I don't think we've seen that, really, for a number of years now, certainly in GC3. If you're team principal, how do you manage that situation? Because we could get to a situation where we go to Donington Park and there aren't that many points between them. It could be winner takes all. Yeah, fingers crossed is the uh, best mentality for the, the, the team uh, owner there, Mark Lemmers, the, the hard one. We see Johnny Cock and Lecong. And I think maybe we've seen the first round of British GT this year where the Lamborghini hasn't looked competitive, potentially from a BOP perspective, or it might just be they haven't nailed on the setup. There's none of the sort of F1 politics going on here as we see Glyn running away, obviously he wants to get home. Uh, and enough of that, he's got to go all the way back to Aberdeen to be fair, so it's not particularly local to the Kent region. Um, yeah, so he's got to work out which one's got the better chance of winning, but they're both paying customers. It's not like Formula One where Ferrari will favour Vettel or Mercedes will favour Hamilton. They're both equal, 50-50. They're both paying customers. So the only thing the team can suggest is not to hit each other, which we've seen already this year, they've managed to achieve quite well. So there's a precedent of teammate contact between the Barwell cars. And it just looks like to me that Ballon is maybe struggling a little bit more than he was at the start of the year. The last time we saw him was unfortunately in the wall at Spa, coming out of Blanchemont. And the teams have all been so busy with Spa 24 hours last weekend. Ballon probably hasn't been in the car since that accident. So rocking up here yesterday at Brown Satchel will be the first time he sat in that car since he would put it in the wall. Mm. So as an amateur, that's a huge thing to try and get over and recover your pace. So he's going to be really struggling, I think, to get on the front foot and match to Han, who's obviously four places above him at this uh, moment in time. 
yeah, the 72 car, remember, is the car that won both races at Snetterton, which was unheard of when we have our, our double header meetings at the start of the year at Alton Park and Snetterton, two one-hour races in a day. They won the first one. That meant they had that 20-second success penalty in race two, and they won again. They were unstoppable. They've scored almost all of their points in those first four races, and then since then, a seventh place at Silverstone, a fifth at Donington, got for the glimmer of home, maybe, but neither of those races were particularly clean for that car. And then, obviously, a non-finish, the first non-finish for either Barwell car this year. And in a championship battle that is as finely poised as that is, with just the half a point separating them, that non-finish could turn out to be disastrous for them. They're not out of it yet by any stretch of the imagination. There is still an hour and 27 minutes left on the clock in this race and another two hours of racing at Donington Park. But certainly the 72 squad are starting now. It would seem the pendulum is swinging more in the favour of the teammate car, which three times has been on the podium this year. And they've been very evenly matched in that respect across the course of the season. So, the uh, race is being led by Graham Davidson under safe car in GT4. It is still Ash Hand, but that nice little cushion he'd built up over Josh Smith may have started to, uh, may have disappeared more or less now as a result of the uh, safety car coming out, out onto the track, excuse me. So it's TF Sport from Tolman, from HHC, uh, from Multimatic, the top four in uh, GT4, and three of those four cars, with the exception of the second place Tolman car, are championship contenders in the, uh, the GT4 ranks. In GT4 Pro-Am, well, Kelvin Fletcher still leads from Nick Jones, and we're trying to get to the bottom of what Nick Jones was doing earlier. Well, it did look as though he was letting people go through, but in doing so, ended up relinquishing the race lead to uh, his big rival in uh, the Pro-Am ranks, at least as far as this race is concerned. And uh, in championship-wise, they are fourth place and 30 points off the championship lead as well. So, yeah, they have got the position they could really afford to give away. There is the car that was leading in GT4 Pro-Am earlier on, the 66 Mercedes which has uh, had its ups and downs this year. I think it's uh, fair to say they did win, though, didn't they, at um, Silverstone earlier on this year. So uh, they'll be, that'll be a fascinating battle to watch for. And with this safety car now, this possibly hands a bit of an advantage to those two. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that those two cars could end up fighting for the outright GT4 victory. And we haven't seen that much this year, have we? Generally speaking, in GT4, those silver driver combos have seemed to have the edge. Yeah, the only thing to put a, a slight spanner in the works there is this safety car has split that GT4 pack with who's on the lead lap uh, of the GT3s. And it, it's so hard. It's just such a shame. A relatively lengthy safety car that we couldn't get the GT4 guys back on the same lap because we're literally going to have a, a six-car GT4 race and then everyone else is going to be in that sub-genre GT4 race where they're just a lap down circumstance of where the GT3 leader passed them. Um, so. Yes, the safety car hurts the Silver Silvers, but in this instance, the only GT4 cars that are on that lead lap, as I said, are Silver Silvers. So the, the winner is going to be a Silver Silver car, even with that extreme pit stop penalty they get. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what they can do. The uh, Bentley is now back in the pit lane, so we could potentially go back to green this lap, or probably the, the one after. We've seen the marshals do a mega job sweeping up and just trying to get rid of all the gravel and detritus that those cars would have dragged off. Crucially, the third car in shot there is the first GT4 car one lap down, and it is the number five car that is currently second in the championship. Now, of the top four championship contenders, they're the only one that was the wrong side of that, and they missed out by, what, maybe a corner. If the safety car had come out maybe a corner or so earlier, they may not have gone a lap down. Um, so that McLaren there, the red and black machine, number five, second in the championship, but they've been trapped almost a full lap now behind their championship rivals. So um, that is one potential dramatic storyline that we need to follow. Of course, things might shuffle out and we get another safety car and they might end up regaining that time. That's certainly what they'll be hoping for, but without another safety car, their chances of outscoring their big rivals have certainly taken a big, big hit. Uh, but as you say, that's just one of those things, unfortunately, whilst it's not fair necessarily, you know, that is racing for you and uh, what works out for you one week may not quite work out at the, uh, at the next race. So we're going to get one more lap of safety car, I think, because I don't think they've quite got the track cleared in time. But uh, we believe it's coming in this time round. So we will get to go racing again. So we're going to have Davidson, Balfe and Fender. The top three in the race are nose to tail as well. They're at the front of the queue. There are no GT4 cars separating them now. Aston Martin, McLaren and this rejuvenated Century Motorsport BMW 
who's your money on to be leading in 23 minutes when the pit lane window opens? I think Battle's going to resume very similarly between Davidson and Valve, and then I think it's going to be a bit clearer, because obviously it's like a restart of the race. All the GT4s are now bunched up behind. So we're going to see five to six laps of no traffic interrupted, which will be great for us to see actually where they all sit and actually what their natural pace is like. Like I said, I think the McLaren's probably got the top end on the Aston, but the Aston just seems so strong all over the lap. It doesn't have a weakness. So it's going to be hard for Balfe to unpick on, on Davidson, I think. And he's then just going to be trying to force a mistake. We've seen Davidson go wide around 30s already. So potentially there's a, a little bit there. Maybe we'll see the old headlight flashing game going on. Um, yeah, so we've got, what, 24 minutes till the GT3s can box. Um, it's going to be hard and fast action, I think, from the, the front three. I don't think the BMW has got the pace from what we saw in the, the opening quarter of this race for me. OK, well, this could be interesting then to see what happens now when we do go racing once again, which is about to happen because the safety car lights have been extinguished and it's pulled away from the rest of the field. Graham Davidson then will choose when to go. He's backing them up for now, not fully accelerated. Now he steps on it and once you accelerate, that's it. You have to commit and he has done. And it's what, maybe a three or four car length advantage that he holds as they come back into our site. And with one hour and 22 minutes, let's call it left on the clock. We're racing once again here in round number eight of the British GT Championship. Graham Davidson leads for TF Sport, the Balfe Motorsport car of Sean Balfe is second, the McLaren and the BMW of Angus found the third. Fourth place, their look, is Ollie Wilkinson, the silver and yellow Aston Martin. Then side by side for fifth position almost as Dominic Paul in the second BMW tries to draw alongside Sam Dahan. Now whilst the leading three don't have any traffic to worry about, the rest of them still are mired amongst these GT4 cars. So for them, it's situation normal really. They're still backing each other and they're trying to battle some more uh, survival amongst the slower GT4 cars. Dahan has got Dominic Paul and Rick Parfit behind Rick Parfit just before the safety car came out. Found a way past the Ram Racing Mercedes of Ian Loggy. Then Adam Ballon and Richard Neary. That's the next little trio, uh, a pair of cars doing battle. Wherever you look, there is action aplenty here. There's Mark Farmer going through. Mark Farmer unfortunately had a spin and brought out a red flag in uh, warm-up earlier on this morning. The car, though, clearly was undamaged and has been able to um, get back out there in the race. He's currently running in 11th place. So, clean restart, thankfully. The top three, as we expected, are pulling away. And, of course, they gained out of the fact that they had all these back markers between themselves and Wilkinson and the rest. They've just been able to set straight off in clean air whilst the rest are still being held up. Yeah, and I think we've seen Wilkinson. He was in fourth on the road, but he had six GT4 cars. So even as he crossed the line on the restart, it was always seven and a half seconds behind. So it's going to be really interesting to see the gap. Once he's cleared those six cars, how big it's grown. And then that gives us a really good indication of how much time they are losing with a GT4 car. So as he completes that first lap, he's just about to clear that six car. So let's see how much that's grown from the seven and a half seconds. It's 8.8, .8. so he's done a good job. He's done six cars and only lost 1.3 seconds. The top three are all still pretty tight, and that could work in his favour. They start to defend and battle each other. He's now got some nice clear track to eat up into and hopefully get on the back of that pack. Uh, yes, well, the fastest man in this group at the moment is Angus Fender. He was some six tenths quicker than the race leader on the previous lap, who in turn is still not really escaping from Sean Balfe. So the top three were covered by eight tenths of a second after the first lap back at full racing speed. Down, Pilgrims drop their go then towards Hawthorne. Not really, as we've said, at the best of places to try and launch and overtake, but if you can apply the pressure and force a mistake out of the car in front, that can sometimes open the door. There is... That's what eight seconds looks like between third and fourth position. And then where is Sam Dehan? There is Sam Dehan, just behind the GT4 Pro-Am leader. And then it is Rick Parfit, who's ahead of Dominic Paul now. So Rick Parfit is into, uh, yes, yeah, sixth position now. So this is a good restart here, a good stint in general for Rick. He always has been a good overtaker, hasn't he? And he tends to race sometimes. Uh, that, that car seems to be a little bit further down the grid than they'd like, but he seems to be able to race towards the front. He's in sixth place now in the Bentley. When you look at that Bentley, you wouldn't necessarily imagine it would go that well around Brands Hatch, but it always seems to, doesn't it? And they're now finally delivering on that promise. Yeah, the Bentley's obviously got a very long wheelbase without stating the obvious, and the longer the wheelbase, the more stable the car is at speed. Um, so there are some nice flowing corners. You you just would assume correctly, like you have, that it would be good in the tighter stuff, Druridge, Graham Hill, but over the lap, it kinds of work itself out even. Mercedes is probably that little bit shorter and more nimble, but then it feels a bit snappier potentially for the AM out the back and they don't have the confidence to get all the lap time 
uh, out of the car, basically, as we see Rick get through another GT4. We're seeing some pretty good driving from the GT4 cars here in terms of making it obvious what they want from the GT3. Opening the door, closing the door, showing when oh. to overtake and when to not. As we see a case study of that not happening there. Uh, and that's that indecisive move. And that's where contact comes, because neither party knows what the other one wants. Yeah, that was close there, wasn't it? That was Dominic Paul trying to get past the number five Tom and Motorsport McLaren, which, uh, as we said, is running down the order somewhat now. They are running eighth place in GT4, so there are seven GT4 cars that essentially gained a lap out of that uh, safety car situation. Dominic Paul avoided contact. Ian Loggy wasn't able to capitalise, and Adam Ballon is with them now, so this safety car benefited him in a way. He's caught that group of cars in front. Now, what can he do? about overtaking them. He is 18 and a half seconds behind the race leader already, but there are more positions up for grabs here and more championship points as well. But remember, unless the 69 car wins the race, then the championship is guaranteed to go down to the wire anyway. So right now, there's not a huge amount of pressure on Adam, ba on, uh, Adam Ballon here. He still do with uh, gaining a few more positions if possible though. And this is where, as an amateur, is how much do you trust your pro? So if you think you've got the best pro out there, the Ballon doesn't have to put the move on Loggy or Paul, because he thinks that, you know what, I think he could do the job for me. And that's a, another dynamic of this pro-am racing. We all talk about the am being quick. Also, the pro can still make a difference in this instance, and we know how quick Phil Keane is, is in that Barwell Lambo, especially around here, then they're going to have a good chance, even if they're a little bit further down. So, for me, Ballon just needs to get his head together, make sure he's we see Loggy <laughs> show his nose there. It's great intent. Um, and Paul's going to have to make sure that he is fully aware of where Loggy is going to be showing his nose over the next few laps. And yeah, we're seeing cars start to transform now as the fuel's coming off. They would have started with around 125 litres. Uh, the safety car, they're still going to be a bit heavier than they would be. Uh, so probably going to have an extra 30 kilos of fuel on if it had just been green flag. So again, that's an interesting dynamic to see how the cars handle that extra bit of weight that they shouldn't have right now. Uh, car number 62, we are hearing, is being given a 10-second stop-go penalty for a start infringement. That's the Academy Motorsport uh, Aston Martin number 62, uh, which is being driven by Alex Toth-Jones at the moment, running seventh. It was the last of the GT4 cars that stayed on the lead lap, so we have to assume that they had some part to play in the demise of the 95 TF Sport Aston Martin at the start of the race. Car 29 being warned about track limits at Graham Hill Bend. That won't be the last time we see that message, I don't think. We're riding on board now with Adam Ballon then, running in ninth place at the moment. Richard Neary behind him in the uh, number uh, eight Team ABBA racing Mercedes AMG GT3. Both of them very evenly matched in a straight line, it would seem. Up to Paddock Hill Bend, you'll see the world just drop away. What a roller coaster ride that is through Paddock Hill Bend. It's all concertinoing together though, behind Sam Dehan again. Sam Dehan. Um, is, uh, as we saw before the safety car really, having to fight a rear guard action here. He's got Rick Parfit breathing down his neck and as they hold each other up, so Dominic Paul and Ian Loggy and Adam Ballon and Richard Neary are starting to close in. So the midfield runners in GT3 are getting themselves closer and closer together. Uh, 61, by the way, also being given a penalty uh, for speeding in the pit lane, which always is a big no-no. That was a bad lap for Academy. That was both their cars getting penalties there. So the uh, ground envelope wasn't big enough from, uh, from them this weekend. Uh, so they've got a bit of work to do. And uh, yeah, the GT4 battle is going to be an interesting one to see how it unfolds now, because those six cars on the lead lap will know that. So they kind of can push a bit more and get away with a mistake or two, lose seconds, and they won't get caught by that, that sub of GT4 that we've got. These, these top three cars are just so close. It's really hard to say. Um, I reckon we've got Andy J in the pit lane with a driver, I can feel it. Yeah, more than just a driver, I've got Glenn here. Glenn, first first up, how are you? Are you okay after the accident? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. It's all right. It wasn't it looked a bigger impact than it was. It, it looked pretty brutal from where we were sat. Yeah, it was it was quick enough, but the impact was less than less than what it looked at our margin, so not too bad. Just talk us through what happened from your perspective. Um obviously I had a bad a bad qualifying, so it was really waiting and playing the long game with everybody and they were starting to make mistakes, picking up a few places and then uh, just going through traffic, uh, got tagged by a bat marker. It looks like, um, well, he's hit me, he's got a puncture, so, uh, or give me a puncture, which put us off, so. Not much we can do, but I don't think we could uh, buy luck this year. It's not been our year for sure, so. Okay, well, I guess it all goes to the final round, so commiserations for today. Yeah, yeah, no problem, thank you.
drama as ever. As soon as we hand over to Andy J, something will happen on the track. You can see there the battle between Ian Loggy and Richard Neary. Ian Loggy has lost ground, and that is, I think, because he's had some sort of a tangle with Dominic Paul in the number three Century Motorsport BMW, which is in the gravel at Clearways. Now, that may, unfortunately, there it is, look. I fear that we may be in for another safety car visit here, and that would further uh, add spice to the mix. Therefore, there's an added sense of urgency here for Rick Parfit to try and get past Sam Deham, because if he can, the five-second gap to Ollie Wilkinson will be eradicated for him. He's certainly a bit quicker than the Lamborghini at the moment, but he just can't quite prise the door open. And because of all of that, Adam Ballon is into seventh place now, look, ahead of both the uh, AMG Mercedes. So this has uh, worked out rather well for one of the uh, Lamborghinis. The other one, though, under an awful lot of pressure here. There's still no sign of a safety car. They're going to do it under a uh, live snatch, apparently. Uh, so we'll see how that one works out. They, we've seen that already today, though, and then the decision was taken to bring a safety car out subsequently. We'll monitor it, but for now, the race can continue, and Rick Parfit is really starting to ask all of the right questions now of Sam Dehan, who's got this championship lead to protect. So how hard does he need to defend from the Bentley here, Joe? Because this is a position that, yes, he'd rather not lose, but it's better than over-defending and getting nerfed into the gravel. Yeah, I think he'll be sizing up Rick, uh, sort of seeing where he's strong and what the pace difference is, really, between the two. And then, because he's got a nice bit of clear track, if Sam Dehan was manning his tyres or just keeping the wrist slow to not get spin, then he might be able to up his game uh, a little bit pace-wise as well and start to kind of catch that top four. I'm amazed there's not a safety car. If we get a shot of where this JCB is, we see Parfit kick up the dust. This is a big ask for the drivers. Yes, the double yellow, yellow is out, which means you should be fully slowing down and controlling your car and even getting ready to come to a stop. The unfortunate problem is, that from a driver's perspective, is it's all risk versus reward management. Yes, you slow down by half a second to make sure the car's in control, but if the guy behind you decides he can get away of only slowing down by a tenth, you lose four tenths. So it's not giving any of them an excuse for not slowing down under yellow. It's the unfortunate nature of the rules that you only have to be slower. There's no set rule. You don't have to be one second slower. You only need to be 1,000 slower in that sector than your, than your best to not attract a penalty. Um, so those guys have got some big decisions to be making through the last corner of the lap with uh, a JCB six foot away from the edge of the track. Well, thankfully, I can see out of the window that the snatch is not in operation, so hopefully only another couple of minutes, and then it should be out of the way. But, uh, yeah, not an ideal situation. Uh, in GT4, it's all going on. This is the number 9070 F Sport Aston Martin then, which is leading the class at the moment with Ash Hand at the wheel. Right up his exhaust pipe, though, is Josh Smith in the number four Tolman Motorsport McLaren. He's second in class, and then the white McLaren at the back of the queue. Well, that is uh, Callum Poynton in the 57 HHC McLaren. Uh, they are the top three in class, and they've now caught some of these GT4 cars that got trapped behind the safety car, so they're in the same class, but they are a lap apart. It's not always that easy, though, is it? Because there's no natural speed advantage for the GT4 car against the other GT4 car. It's not always easy to get past them, especially when they're running side by side in front of you. So this is a big moment now for Hand. He needs to try and clear this traffic as quickly as possible. Yeah, and it's not obvious to the other GT4 cars that they're a lap apart because they haven't done anything wrong. If you don't assume to get lapped by someone in the same class as you this quickly, if your pace isn't a million miles off. So, yes, the teams can speak to the drivers over the radio, but those drivers might not be asking the question the teams might not have realised. So Hand has got the hard job here. He's got, he's the wedge. He's got to open the door to get through. And then actually Smith can sit there and just let Hand do the work and just follow him through. Hand might be able to palm him off and be able to work it out all right. But it's an added risk for him, unfortunately, that the other guys behind him don't have to worry about so much. Uh, yes, indeed. Remember as well that Hand, when he comes in for the pit stop, as well as serving... Oh, uh, Ian Loggy's off and Paddock Hill Ben. I'll finish that thought, thought in a moment. Thankfully, digs his way out of the gravel trap. But Ian Loggy from ninth place has been off, so he's lost a few places. Mark Farmer's gone through, so has Mike Ligo and Andrew Howard. So down to 12th place will drop the Ram Racing Mercedes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, back to GT4 then. Ash Hand, the 97 car, will have to serve an extra 20 seconds in the pit stop because they won last time. Uh, so, too, actually, will the car that's second in the championship. So, the day going from bad to worse for the number five HHC, uh, uh, sorry, uh, top of Motorsport McLaren, uh, which may well, therefore, have the advantage rather to the 57 HHC car and the 15 Multimatic car, which both are still on the lead lap. There is your race leader then, Graham Davidson. Now, Sean Ball, it would appear, unless he's been held up in traffic somewhere, which I don't think is the case, uh, is now starting to focus more on what's going on behind him than out in front. He's dropped back from Davidson, whether intentionally or not, I don't know, and all of a sudden, 
Angus Fender is looking a little more ominous in his wheel tracks, only four tenths of a second between them as they came through onto the 31st lap of racing. That's the view from behind the Adam Bollock Ballon uh, piloted Lamborghini at the front of the Richard Neary Mercedes, which is up the inside, coming through clearways. The yellow flags have gone in from there now, so they can overtake, and they go either side of the Porsche. That was really close stuff. And Matt Lamborghini's got some poke in a straight line now because it was actually able to outdrag the Mercedes despite not being as quick off clearways. Interesting stuff there because straight line speed's not always been the big strength of the Lamborghini, has it? No, and actually down the pitch straight, if you're on the outside, it's a longer distance because it's always turning. You're going, you're going further, so this is the Ram car going wide. These guys, this year, jump you wise seem to like win or bin. They're either like first or second or, or nowhere. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be the nowhere one, especially with the success penalty uh, they're going to have to carry. So, yeah, um, yeah, that Lambo looks strong in the speed traps, which is always a nice thing as a driver. If you're the quickest at the end of the straight, it's easy to overtake it, easier to defend from the car. But see the Mercedes now, this is a similar speed they'll be doing. It just shows the slipstream effect, kind of sucking the Mercedes into the rear of this Lamborghini. Here he's got confidence to follow the car, even in the disturbed air coming off the back of this car. Um, that's only a couple of metres, so yeah, I think their pace is pretty similar. Neary maybe hitting a bit too much curb. You see the car bounce up, uh, riding the curbs, as we see the GT4 guys going through turn one. Still no stale. It doesn't really look like they've split from this at all. That Mustang isn't part of the race lead, as we know, um, but has been there for the last few laps. So he's obviously got great pace and has no intention of jumping out of the way for these guys just yet. This is what we saw at Spa though, isn't it? That the TF Aston Martin and the Tolman McLarens, there is nothing to choose between them. For about an hour, the 97 Aston Martin followed the number five McLaren and just wasn't able to get through until, as we said, at the end of the penultimate lap when they made contact. But until then, literally to the hundredth of a second, they were lapping almost identically. And it seems to be a similar situation here, but with the inclusion now, of the other championship contending McLaren, the uh, 57 HHC example. They're still bottled up behind the uh, race performance um, Ford Mustang of Sam Smelt, which is running um, in about 15th or 16th in uh, GT4. But as you said, a lap behind these three cars now, essentially, because of the way that safety car period uh, worked for them. Right, we've got an hour and six minutes to go, which means we are only uh, four minutes away from the GT4 pit lane window opening, and then a, a further four minutes, of so eight minutes away from the GT3 cars being able to pit. Someone's on the grass coming out of Sterling's, well and truly. Who was that and where have they gone? I think everyone's still there, so it must have been just a run wide. There's an awful lot of dust getting kicked up in the face of the GT4 leading trio. We've got back through now to the completion of another lap of the Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit across the start finish line into Paddock Hill Bend, and the HHC McLaren looking racy now, trying to move through into second position. You'd always rather come in and hand over to your co-driver in second than third, wouldn't you? So I don't think we're going to see um, the uh, 57 car of Callum Point and backing off anytime soon. Yeah, and we see the leader of the GT3, Davidson, coming through now. So, yeah, there's a, a huge amount of risk for not much time left for these guys. And as we saw at Spa, they went down to the last lap of the GT4 leaders uh, clashing. Uh, and unfortunately, Event Smith and Dorlin didn't even get on the podium after leading so much uh, of that last stint. So GT4 is going to get two more laps before the pit window will open. And then generally, if you're the car that's tucked up behind, let's say the HHC car behind the Tom guy, you definitely want to come in early because you're losing time. You can't run to the pace that you potentially could. So these sort of the guys are definitely going to come in. The other guys, if actually they've got a good bit of traffic and the engineer decides, you know what, I'd rather leave you out for a couple of laps and then we can try and work out if we can undercut each other. That's when the, the team really earn their money and get the tactics involved. Indeed, so GT3 cars now coming through, which also mixes up this battle. It can sometimes work in the favour of some of the GT4 cars. It may also hold them up if they have to really jump out of the way of the quicker GT3 machinery. Graham Davidson with a really late lunge up the inside there of the GT4, Aston Martin. I think he backed out of that particular manoeuvre. It was Jack Butel in the uh, 35 machine. Should be able to now drive straight around the outside and across the start finish line. But uh, that now leaves the three leading GT4 cars free to battle again. And actually, the gap between them has stayed pretty much exactly the same as it was, with Ash Hand still leading the way. So we started the race with McLaren's on pole position in both classes. Now it's Aston Martin's leading both classes. And it's TF Sport leading both classes as well. I don't think we've uh, seen a situation yet this year where the same team has won in both classes. And TF Sport always were 
fairly likely to be able to do that. Uh, uh, cars 3 and 31, an incident between the two of them is under investigation. 31 is Rick Parfit and 3 is Dominic Paul, so we were sort of suspecting it might have been Ian Lockie that he tangled with. It sounds like it was Rick, unfortunately, that has uh, ended up being involved with the number three car that's now out of the race. Yeah, we see uh, Balfe, unfortunately, kind of get boxed in there. It's like what they do on the motorway and the police want to talk to you. They get one car in front and one by the side. You can't move anywhere. Um, and that's lost him a load of time. And this has given Davidson a chance to just get away that little bit more. Could be three and a half, four seconds by the end of the lap. So that just means when Johnny Adam takes over, He's got that little bit of breathing space. He doesn't have to push so much, whereas Rob Bell and Jack Mitchell inherit the cars from, from Bell and Fender, respectively, have got a lot of work to do now. Um, four more minutes, so three more laps, most probably until the window is definitely open for these guys. The silver, silver car, like the GT4s, has got an option when to box so much, whereas the Pro-Am car, it makes so much sense to get in as early as you can. Uh, we're seeing differences around here of a second to one and a half between the Pro and the Amp, so every lap you get the Pro in more, there's a free second in your pocket uh, compared to your, uh, your rivals. 4.1 seconds, by the way, is the lead that Graham Davidson enjoys over this pair, so they really have dropped back now in the uh, traffic as well. They head through Druid's corner, a bit wide there for Angus Fender. Ollie Wilkinson, by the way, is 12.3 seconds behind them and hasn't been able to live with their pace since the restart. I do wonder whether maybe in the back of his mind. Now, he's lost a bit of confidence in that car, regardless of what it was that caused the spin. I'm sure that it caught his attention, and he'll be really hoping that the same thing doesn't happen again. So we may well see that uh, that was the reason, possibly, for his loss of pace, because he was pulling away in the race lead at the time of the spin. Sam the hand still fifth in the number 69 Lamborghini, but that will not be enough to wrap up the title. Uh, sixth place is Rick Parfit, with Adam Ballon breathing down his neck, I noticed as well a moment or two ago, with Richard Neary, Mark Farmer and Michael Igo rounding out the top ten. The 13th place car overall is your GT4 leader, Ash Hand with Josh Smith and Callum Poynton right behind, as you can see on the graphic down the left-hand side of the screen. So, pit lane window is open now for GT4s. They will have four minutes of time to get into the pit lane before the GT3s are then able to pit, but uh, it's not a four-minute window, it's just to try and split the window because it's such a narrow pit lane. You don't want both classes of car coming in at the same time. The first car to come in is going to be the uh, Porsche Cayman, the GT Marks car of Chris Carr, to hand over to Dino Zamparelli. A few others are starting to trickle in as well, and as you suspected, generally speaking, it's pro-amp cars. Yeah, massive. We had a huge moment on the pit entry there with the uh, Fox car, Murphy, trying to come in, and the Optimum car trying not to, and we're seeing absolute chaos. And I think Brands actually it from that extra bit of chicane coming in. There's no real need for it. I don't know why they do it, why you can't just come straight in. I'm actually uh, taking a wing mirror off on the right-hand side coming in, and I've managed to blame someone else, but <laughs> it is very tight. That point there, you can be going as fast as you can. There's no speed limit. The speed limit starts after that, where the 50 kilometers an hour comes in. So yeah, it looks like we've got probably 70% of the GT4 guys coming in. Drivers have to be behind that white line before the refueling can take place. Slightly different rules to every other championship in the in the world just for fun. We see the Tolman cars both in. Looks like they're going to use dump churns on the second car rather than the big fuel rig. So 25 to 30 liters in need for those dump churns. So they're going to have to do four of those each. Uh, the way the regulations are, there's only one fuel rig per team. So you can only have one, that can only work on one car at a time, but there's no rule on the, the dump churn element, so you can still have both in at the same time. Uh, and then it just depends on priority between the team. As we see Bannon right on the rear of De Han. So that, that battle is completely transformed. I completely wrote Bannon off earlier, gave him some good excuses, and now all of a sudden there's less than a second between them. And this is going to be super exciting once the uh, the pros take over. And Parfit's in the mix as well. And so we know Cocker, we know Keane, we know Morris are all going to be super quick and competitive. So I don't think this fight's going to die down anytime soon just because they're going to change driver. We've also got Onzo Cole this weekend instead of Krista Dulu getting into the Abba car. And none of these four cars have success penalties either, so this battle will continue afterwards. Here comes Parfit around the outside of Adam Ballon, who has overtaken him on the previous lap. So Ballon has cleared the Bentley, which is now trying to fight back as they go through Paddock Hill Bend. Up the hill they go. This takes the pressure off of um, the Sam Dehan Lamborghini momentarily. And Richard Neary now tries to join in the fun as well. Goes around the outside of the Bentley. Oh, which spins coming out of Druids, and Rick Parfit's thrown it away again into the tyre wall he goes. We were on board with the Lamborghini looking back and around she went. Now, thankfully, 
he's been able to rejoin. It takes an awful lot to break one of those Bentleys, and that little kiss against the barriers, it'll brush off in, a, in an instant, but uh, uh, another another spin for Rick, and unfortunately, as quick as he's been, arguably the quickest AM driver in the championship on his day, there have been a few mistakes this year, haven't they? Ultra Park Race 2, he had a spin. Snetterton, he had an off as well. Uh, and now here, too, he had that bit of contact as well, remember, with Sam Dehan, actually, on the first lap at Spa last time out. He's quick. We know he's quick. He's won the championship before with Seb Morris. This year, though, for whatever reason, things haven't quite clicked. Yeah, it just shows how hard all of these guys are pushing. They're all on the limit, and then when you're on the limit, unfortunately, mistakes come in. And it just looks like from the outside that Bentley isn't so easy to get on top of. To spin a car like that should be impossible because it's got traction control, which stops those rear wheels from spinning up, which in then turn just stop the car from rotating. We see Neary get his nose down, and these guys are probably going to come into the pit lane. Potentially, the window no. is open for them. Interesting. Interesting decision. We've already got Wilkinson in from the GT3 lead uh, of the silver class, so it's going to be interesting to see why they haven't boxed. Dehan as well, uh, the window is open to us. An interest. I don't know if they got distracted by each other and didn't want to do so. We get another look at this. So he'll get on the throttle now at the apex. The rear is going to rotate and it's just gone. So he's put the opposite lock in because it hasn't fully spun. But those rear tyres are just spinning around quicker than they're gaining traction. And that's why the car rotates. So to hand out the car, Cocker helping him out. Close the door behind the line, as I said. Refueling starts. Path it in. So bonnet is up. Uh, I think the boys will probably throw a bit of tape on that. There's uh, some catches. Uh, fast release catches that probably have just been snapped. They're only brittle plastic, a little bit of metal in them. So, yeah, a bit of tape, that'll be fine. The wind will push that down rather than lift it up anyway. But, yeah, the uh, we might get the scrutineer overlooking that, just making sure he's happy with it. Seb just trying to work out what sort of car he's going to inherit as we see the leader take into the pit lane. And I think we'll see everyone in GT3 boxes lap out coming in. Interestingly, the top three stayed out an extra lap, which was not what we expected. So you were quite right, Ollie Wilkinson was the first car to come in. But yeah, in there will come one, two, three. Everybody now in GT3, more or less, coming into the pit lane. Adam Ballon uh, may inherit the race lead if he doesn't stop, but I would imagine he probably will. So pit stop penalty-wise then, what's the story here? Well, actually, none of the top six or seven cars, I think, actually have success penalties to serve because all of those that did well at Spa seem to have had issues, the exception being the Optimum Motorsport Aston Martin, which does have that 20 seconds. So they're likely to drop behind that little battle pack we were watching with the Barwell cars and the Bentley and the Mercedes. So uh, this will be a slightly jumbled order, but in theory, the top three cars, at least, should come out pretty much where they were. Down the pit lane comes Adam Ballon. So Mark Farmer leads the race now uh, in the number two TF car because he has not yet stopped. Yeah, we've seen a really tight pit lane. Actually, Ballon came in and the Sentry guys are waiting and Ballon just clipped the car control of the, uh, the, the Sentry guy. It looks like he's OK, but it just shows you how tight it is in this pit lane and thus how easy it is to lose time with a little incident like that. So, yeah, we've got to wait for everyone to obviously leave the pit lane to see where the order is, but it should stay pretty similar. Apart from that optimum car, like you said, the top six are penalty unaffected. So, uh, Dehan has passed over to Cocker, who's in a load of space. So he's potentially going to get a really good out lap while everyone else is in the pit lane. He's going to be able to sort of maybe jump them potentially because he's got a lap extra in the car than the pros in, in who he's racing against. Yeah, we'll see in just under a minute's time then when he gets back to the start-finish line exactly where he filters back out. But uh, yeah, so Mark Farmer then leads the way because he's the only GT3 car that's not yet been in for its pit stop. Out goes uh, the 47 car now with Johnny Adam behind the wheel. So Johnny Adam um, should still be in the race lead, I would imagine. He's uh, got out in front of the Balfour Motorsport McLaren and the Century Motorsport BMW. That's, I suspect that they're all still in the same order. Back onto the track they go. There's no sign yet of Johnny Cocker either, but then he was some way behind those three anyway. So that will still be the order at the front. Then it will be 47 from 22 from 9, but now Johnny Adam in the lead. Rob Bell second in the McLaren and immediately stuck in traffic with Jack Mitchell in the number nine BMW in third, and there is Johnny Cocker, who comes across the line next. So I think he's going to be fourth, isn't he? Which is good for the 69 car. They didn't lose any places. Yeah, the big win Cocker's had there, if we see Phil Keith just leaving the pit lane. We saw those cars, how close they were within a second on the in-lap. Uh, that is now growing to three or four. So that's that extra lap for the pro that we're, we're showing. That is the evidence of what it can do. So yeah, Phil needs to get his, uh, his head down now, uh, championship-wise. They're next to each other on the track, so it's going to be interesting to see how this battle uh, transforms over the next 
53 minutes. Yeah, 69 are half a point ahead of 72, but they are, as you said, several seconds ahead on the road, so they could be set to extend the margin, but not by a huge amount. And for the neutral fans, if they finished fourth and fifth, that would be about the perfect result because neither would have a penalty at Donington. It would be a straight up winner takes all fight for the championship in the final two hour race of the season. Mark Farmer has pitted, by the way, now in the number two TF Sport car. So this car is about to come through and re inherit the race lead. The Johnny Adam out in front. I'll give you the gaps now as well as the safety car is called. The safety car is scrambled. Now, why? Do we have a safety car? There's nothing that we can see from where we are, so it must be something on the Grand Prix circuit that has brought about the safety car for the second time in this race. So the gaps I'm about to give you are completely irrelevant. Interestingly, I think that's going to mess up the GT4 battle even more. No. I've just seen the leaders in front of the Tolman car, which was second on the track. So some debris from potentially the Mercedes running wide that dust so you can't see it but what was happening or imagine the diffuser is caught on the top of the curb to, uh the han or cocker and depending on when we're in it's just split that that's uh it's hard up here because i want to say what i really think and i'm gonna say i'm probably not being right back but we don't have a safety car for jcb next year but then we have a five kilo bit of carbon fiber and a safety car thrown. so i've got no logic to apply unfortunately so i'll let you guys at home decide why that is and uh, i'll give you my uh, opinion like it is no comment, I think, is my response to that, but I know, I know exactly what you mean, but uh, the safety car is out. That is the fact, and it means that, once again, everything bunches up just after the pit stop window had pretty much been dealt with. Everyone has made their mandatory stop now, and I can't give you the gaps because the gaps are fairly irrelevant, but I can give you the order. Johnny Adam leads the way in the number 47, Aston Martin. Second, Rob Bell there in the number 22, McLaren. Third, number nine, BMW of Jack Mitchell. Fourth for Johnny Cocker, and Phil Keane will now catch him as well. I don't think there are any back markers between them, so that's going to be a fascinating battle upon the restart. Into sixth position, by the way, is the Beach Dean Aston Martin of Valentin Hasclo, who uh, is making his debut in British GT this weekend alongside uh, Andrew Howard. And uh, the number 99 machine has quietly sort of gone about its business and has moved into sixth position. A really solid race for them so far. Dennis Lind is seventh for WPI Motorsport. Eighth is Tom Onslow Cole, now into the number eight um, uh, Aber Racing Mercedes. Nicky Team is ninth. This also plays into his hands. He's one of the fastest drivers in the championship, as we know. Bradley Ellis is 10th, so that's what that cost them with their success penalty. Optimum Motorsport down to 10th position with Seb Morris 11th for JRM and Ian Loggy 12th, the last of the GT3 cars. In GT4, where has the, the 97 cars dropped? Oh, that's because it had that silver. So I might be throwing a conspiracy out here but that safety car was very well timed to get all the gt4 cars on the same lap again so we see the leader of the race adam behind the safety car behind him is the leader of gt4 so that thus means everyone behind him is going to get the lap back and catch up i don't quite not definitely not clever enough to work out if that means everyone get the lap back they lost on the first safety car but the safety car couldn't have been put at a better place to get everyone back together in GT3, but also GT4. So there's a lot to pan out here. We've got to work out where the stops have put everyone. But yeah, we've got the two leaders of both classes behind the safety car. Yes, the five McLaren I can see is still behind the four McLaren, which is leading the class. Number four leads in GT4, James Dawlins. They've, they've taken the lead over the pit stop window and the number five car is still a lap behind them. So it doesn't help them particularly. But you're right, the leaders, at least now in GT4, are, are back together again. But there's been an issue somewhere for the 97 car because it was leading and it's now seventh in GT4. Ah, they had... 20 seconds. Yes, they did. I've slept since Spa, clearly. Uh, 20 <laughs> seconds, their success penalty. That makes sense, doesn't it? So they've dropped down to seventh. So that means that number four, James Dawlin, leads the way now in GT4. Second is the 57 HHC uh, McLaren uh, of Dean McDonald. And third for the championship leaders, Seb Prio, in the uh, Multimatic Ford Mustang. Now, if he can get himself into the lead of the race and win it, which is easier said than done, I realise, then mathematically, they could wrap up the championship here today. But again, it's highly unlikely because even if they do win, they need others to finish um, further down the order. So there's been a jumble in GT4. GT3 has stayed more or less as it was. We've cleared the debris. We've punched everyone back together. And now we're going to go racing again because the lights are out on the safety car. And Johnny Adam has well, about half a dozen or so GT4 cars between himself and Rob Bell. And you'll see Johnny Wario Fox, he'll back everyone up. So those GT4s are going to take a longer time to get going. 
Uh, so he's got the biggest possible gap to Rob Bell. He just, that is so much luck, but he's done everything he can to maximise on that luck. But that's almost taken the fight away now. Unless we get another safety car and they're together with no traffic. Rob can't overtake that GT4 McLaren until the line as well. So it's not even as soon as it goes back to green and Johnny's gone. It's five seconds straight away just given to you like that. Um, so it's going to make Rob's day a lot, lot harder to try and get back up to that top step. Nicky team there was trying to go around the outside of Bradley Ellis into Paddock Hill Bend. Did that one work? They're still side by side. In fact, that's for um, ninth position that the two Aston Martins from rival teams are fighting for. Uh, and it looks as though they're still side by side out of Druid with uh, uh, Tom Onslow Cole just in front of them as well. We'll see them appear into shot, hopefully, at the top of our screen. Uh, any second now. There they go. And team has gone past the optimum uh, Aston Martin. This, though, is the fight for the championship. The top two in the championship, 69 and 72 Barwell Motorsport Lamborghinis, nose to tail as they head down Pilgrim's Drop once again. They're running in fourth and fifth places respectively. Whichever one of these two cars finishes ahead of the other in this race will lead the championship going into the final round. It's looking increasingly unlikely that the championship will be won today. The question now is who leads going to Donington and by what margin? And there was a bit of a stumble there for uh, Phil Keane as he lapped one of the Mustangs and that brings the other Lamborghini of Dennis Lind right onto his tail. Yes, yeah, so we've got a three-way three Lambo fight, easy for me to say, and Lind doesn't really care. He's not in the championship, so he can really be the stick of dynamite in this. That Mustang was also the GT4 championship leader so there's so many dynamics falling into place here it's hard to keep it going and if you are watching at home and want to see the timing screen it's definitely worth loading up tsl timing you can follow it all live all the sectors it's great to see what's going when we can't cover everything with one camera unfortunately um, and it does look like the lambo pace is all quite similar at the moment phil is able to keep with cocker but then lynn's able to kick stay with the two of them so again we're going to just have to see how these cars move over 45 minutes Johnny's up to do the work. Phil can just follow him through there on these GT4 cars. And this is going to be the, the sort of story of the, the rest of the race, I think. Oh, that oh. call's going to close. Johnny Cocker up the inside of the number 35, Aston Martin there, going into Graham Hill Bend uh, with uh, Conor O'Brien now at the wheel. That was close stuff. But yeah, these three Lamborghinis together. Dennis Lynn then did gain a place on the previous lap at the expense of Valentin haas Clo in the Beach Dean Aston Martin. That's why we now do have Lamborghinis fourth, fifth and sixth. It could not be closer between the two of them. The KTM crossbow, though, holds the inside line. Can Phil Keane get to the inside into Hawthorne? Dennis Lynn goes on the inside of the back marker as well. That was breathtaking stuff as they went down the hill into the fastest corner on the track and they're battling with each other inches apart and ducking and diving between the GT4 traffic which themselves are having a race as well this is why we love multi-class GT racing it doesn't get better than this does it definitely doesn't we've just seen Phil lose a bit of time and he, he was conservative with that BMW and that's that championship mentality and although these three cars are exactly the same homologation wise they're all the same power same weight as we see, yeah, I think that was Nicky team making a gap that probably wasn't there uh, work for him. But there is an, almost an infinite amount of settings on these cars they can do. Wing positions, ride heights, cambers, pressures, so many differences. So that's why we see the cars, even though they're the same, be stronger. And it looked like Phil maybe had a bit more top speed than Johnny. Hard to say if it was slipstream, he would just be running a little less wing. You can just try and see how much rear wing you can see there further upright it is the more downforce you generate but unfortunately more drag so we'll try and work out where those three Lamborghinis are stronger than each other because I think this battle is going to rage on all the way uh, well yes and what a pivotal battle it is as well but as you said Dennis Lynn doesn't care one little bit about their championship situation he's in it for himself and for the WPI Motorsport team who have uh, rather caught people's attention this year they've only had the one podium but they've been fairly consistently quick and for a, a new team into the championship very much as well they didn't race with this car actually at the first uh, two races at Alta Park they had that GTC class Porsche upgraded to the Lamborghini though and immediately uh, were on form and as you can see are every bit as quick as the Barwell squad who have been running Lamborghini since the dawn of time. So uh, this is uh, another good performance here. And Dennis Lind, we know, can make some spicy overtakes, but how aggressive will he be willing to be, I wonder, with the, the two cars contesting the championship lead? Out of Sterling's and Phil Keane, a mistake from Phil Keane. That's something you don't see happen all that often. It hasn't cost him too much, but just easy to do that, isn't it? That's a bank left hand. You think you can carry more speed in there, but then eventually you go too quickly. And oh, <laughs> now Dennis Lind runs wide out of clearways. 
easy to run wide there and easy for that to end in quite a big accident. Yeah, luckily for Phil, uh, this year they've reprofiled the exit kerb, so it's now a normal FIA kerb. It used to be a, just a random shaped bit of concrete they'd laid on the exit. I've run over it a few times and you can feel it grind in the bottom of the chassis, which then makes the car go light. So it'd be amazing actually to get Mark Lemmer's thoughts on Barwell if uh, we can get Andy J down there, because he's the guy who's having to control this. And like we said, there's no team orders, but I'll just be fascinated to see as we see a car pull off behind the trees, uh, I think GT4 Porsche, which unfortunately hadn't been having the best day anyway, but uh, yeah, save a bit of fuel and uh, they can get back to the pit lane. As we see Lynn now really on the back of Keane. Like we said, Hawthorne's isn't a big enough break for an obvious overtake, very easy to cover. We see Phil on the defensive line. And it does look like he's got a bit more straight line speed there. He's got a couple of lengths by the end of that straight. Oh. And all the time we see uh, Lynn run wide. I think it is a real testament to these boys are at the limit. There's, there's nothing really showing uh, anything at all. So uh, I think it's a good chance to throw down to the pit lane with Andy J. Yeah, we have been watching that battle with interest. I'm not at Barwell, as Joe was hoping, but nonetheless, I have the man who's currently sat out the front with, with Johnny, and you are loving watching the Lambo battle, aren't you? Because it's doing you some favour. Yeah, it'd be great if the Lambos would trip over each other and not fall out the race, but uh, I think that's asking for too much. We'll just, we just have to hope that the, the cars around them keep them busy and uh, allow Johnny to, to get the win for us. Graham, you put in a brilliant first stint. You must be feeling pretty confident. It looks like you've got a decent lead, and Johnny's so competent round here, isn't he? Yeah, I'm, I'm you know, as, as happy as I could be. I didn't expect for us to come into the pits in the lead, but uh, I, I, I made some do-or-die moves in the first lap to, to get me into the position to, to secure the lead, and, and luckily for me, Optimum had their spin, and, and then it was just a case of managing the traffic and keeping Sean Balfe at bay. You're determined to take this all the way to Donington, of course, where last time out you were victorious. Yeah, I, uh, I want to make sure that Barwell don't have it easy and I want to fight for the championship at my favourite track at the end of the season. So, yeah, it's on. Right. It's on. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Andy. Well, that gave me a chance to break the calculator out and figure out provisionally what the championship might look like if Graham Davidson and Johnny Adam can hang on to take the victory. They would move on to 116 points. So if, for whatever reason, the Barwell cars were to fall out of the top six, that would actually give 47 the championship lead. If things finish as they are now, Barwell's 69 car would go on to 122.5, so there would be six and a half points in it between the Lamborghini and the Aston Martin. So that is getting very tight indeed now, but it could well be that we still have an Aston Martin in play going to Donington. Now, Joe, what have you spotted on the McLaren? Yeah, rear left fender just working loose. Um, it's a little bit of an aerodynamic aid. It lets the air run off the back of the car a bit quicker. I know in our development how many of these we tried and all the feedback I had to give them the different iterations of them, but it's more the legality thing. The FIA say the rear wheel has to be covered. You can't see the whole surface of the tyre. So if that falls off, no problem. Won't lose much, much time at all. It's just potentially big enough where the scrutineer might not be happy with that sort of size bodywork flapping and coming loose. We've already seen a safety car because of loose bodywork. So uh, yeah, we'll see as we jump on board the GT4 Mustang championship leader. It looks like a fake Lamborghini, that KTM for mine a bit, doesn't it? But the pace of it's been pretty good this weekend at times. So they're obviously getting on top of it a little bit more. Carbon fibre chassis, so it's a, a good basis of the car. I believe it's still a turbo-engined Audi block in the back of it as well. So it's a fairly reliable lump and just a huge train of GT4 cars behind it. But uh, it looks like the Pied Piper at the moment is having a good day. Uh, not all of this is for position. The Aston Martin that is immediately behind Seb Prio is a lap behind him, but the next Aston Martin in the queue, a few cars back, is the 75 car, um, which is running for, uh, fifth place in class. That's uh, Mike Robinson at the wheel. Ah, car 99, so this is the Beach Dean Aston Martin that we said was doing so well. Three seconds stop-go penalty for being three seconds too short in the pit lane. It's a second per second that you were under the pit stop per time. And so, unfortunately, that will drop them out of seventh place and free up Tom Onslow Cole to try and chase down the Lamborghini battle in front. So that's a shame for Beach Dean on their return to the championship. But here... Semprio in the, in the slightly bizarre situation of having to defend from a car that's a lap behind him, but this is all just because of the fact that we had that safety car, it split the GT4 path, but they're all clearly capable of running the same sort of speed as each other. How hard does he defend this, and it, do you reckon he's even aware of the situation with the cars behind him? 
Yeah, I mean, Multimatic running four GTE cars in the World Endurance Championship gives Seb all the information he needs. Just amazing he hasn't been able to clear this KTM yet. And it, it, as you said, it's not for uh, full position now. So it's hard for the for race directors. And as we see a car off, HHC 57, 58. That's um, Jamie Caroline making his debut in the championship, actually. Tom, let's go. He was winning races here in the British Formula 3 Championship. That car looks like it's been buried, doesn't it? There's even gravel on the roof as finally Prio has prized the door open and got past that KTM, which always gets nerfed by the Aston Martin. The TF Sport car losing ground there. That could be crucial. The 97 car, which already had lost ground because of its pit stop penalty, has, I think, just lost at least one, maybe two places. Yes, it was two places going down the Cooper Strait. It's all kicking off in GT4 as they go through Surtees, as the, the pin has been pulled now, rather, in this group, and it's all starting to explode into life. The battle that is for position here, then, by the looks of it, involves the 95 Aston Martin, uh, which, sorry, 75 Aston Martin, which is fifth in GT4, and then the 43 BMW, the um, Aston Martin 77 of Michael Broadhurst, and also, uh, sorry, 11 of uh, Michael Martin Plowman, excuse me, uh, and also the TF Sport 97 car as well, which we mentioned of Tom Caddick. So they're all fighting for position in amongst cars that are not fighting for position with them. But I think they're starting now slowly to get themselves uh, separated from the, uh, the lap traffic. More just, it's starting to look like a round of the British Rallycross Championship, this isn't it? Yellow flags out at clearways. Now, are they going to cover this with a, another live snatch? Looks like they are, because that's in about the same sort of position that the BMW ended up about oh, 40 minutes ago or so. <laughs> I need to remember to breathe in this <laughs> race. Here's a replay. Oh, I lost it early going in there. It's quite, quite right. His window's open as well, so he's going to be uh, eating gravel for the next few days. Yeah, losing it that early on entry, it's either going to be like a wheel on turning on the grass, which unsettles the rear, but knowing that car so well, and any mid-engine car is so stable on entry because all the weight is over the rear axle. So, yeah, wheel turning in. There wasn't anyone around him from my point of view that would have hit him. So, yeah, the cameraman's done really well to catch it as soon as he could, but unfortunately we haven't really seen the cause as we yeah, see another live snatch just under double yellow. So same problem as earlier. Those drivers have got to work out how slow they go risk versus reward and there's just so much battling going on in this GT4 department it's going to be hard to work out where everyone's going to work out championship wise at the end of this one I think. Martin Plowman then the car on screen the GT4 BG Aston Martin is still leading in GT4 Pro-Am somewhere they've bought a lap over the 66 Mercedes with which way they were scrapping earlier on. That car looks like it's ahead of it on the road, but actually it's nearly a lap behind, so they've really lost ground. The car on your screen now, uh, and they are now down to sixth place in GT4 Pro-Am. So Plowman leads in Pro-Am. Second place is Michael Broadhurst in the number 77 Mercedes, the Fox Motorsport Mercedes. And third in GT4 Pro-Am is the number 20 car of uh, Michael O'Brien. So they are your top three cars in GT4 Pro Am, another championship that was separated by just half a point coming into this weekend. Pit stop incident between cars 42 and 72 will be investigated after the race. 42 is Century Motorsport BMW. I think that's what I saw out the window uh, was yes. Ballard hitting the car controller of 42. And yes, it sounds quite extreme, a car hitting a person, but I generally think it was a racing incident in terms of a car and a person. The car controller is there to get his car in. Now, Ballon had nowhere to go. He wouldn't have got that car into his box without getting close to that car controller, who I don't think was aware Ballon needed to come in. So, yeah, hopefully, I, I don't think it really should change the championship. Ballon had to do what he had to do, um, as we see the McLaren get pulled away. Um, we've got Andy, uh, Andy J down in the pit lane. Who you got, Andy? I got Josh Smith here with me, Josh. Great first stint, got to the front. Safety car kind of um, challenged your ambitions a little, didn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, a great first start. Well, the start was um, was great. Uh, managed to go from fourth to P2. Um, properly jumped the gun and uh, managed to gain a few places. It got a bit iffy with uh, with the GT3s. We were kind of mixing with them at first, but uh, once the race settled out, um, managed to gap the rest of the pack a bit, uh, me and the uh, TF Aston. So, uh, yeah, but then the safety car chucked a spanner in the works and uh, I had a headache from then on really but uh, yeah um, it was a good first stint. Were well, you thinking to yourself when that safety car came in hang on this is spa all over again where's our luck? Uh, kind of but obviously it was more focusing on the job in hand um, uh, I kind of saw it as an opportunity to potentially jump the Aston but also it's another opportunity for the McLaren behind to have a have a go at us but I had to put it into perspective at the end of the day I knew um, uh, that the Aston had a 20 second pit stop penalty so I was kind of very calm and collected and uh, 
just knew that all I had to do was keep the uh, the McLaren behind, and we'd be we'd be looking in good shape for, for James to jump in the car. And he's doing a good job at the moment. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it. We'll uh, we'll let you watch on anxiously for the rest of the race. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Guys, back to you. Thank you very much, Andy. So we've got the two Tom and Motorsport McLarens on the screen, and the number four car of James Dorlin that you're seeing the first of the two cars is second place within their class, and they are some 29 seconds behind the 62 car. Now, the 62 car, unbeknownst to us, has somehow come out with the GT4 lead. Now, that must have been because it pitted. I think it was one of the last cars to pit, and so when it was in the pit lane, the uh, safety car uh, came out, everyone else slowed down, and they came out with the lead, so there they are. Number 62 leading the way, which was started by Alex Toth-Jones. It's now Will Moore uh, behind the wheel. Now, I'll have to scan through my paperwork to see what their best finish of the year is so far. I don't think we've even mentioned them, really, uh, throughout the bulk of the season. They're a long way down in the championship standings as well, so this is a much-needed result for them. They're 19th in GT4, and they've not had a podium yet. And they've done two pit stops as well. They came in earlier in the first stint with a problem. So they've actually been in the pits twice oh, and still yeah. to be leading shows you what a safety car can do for you and it's probably a bit of a hedging their bets on academy that you can just box a bit later and if you get a safety car then this is the reward we see it missing a wing mirror as well so that's had an eventful race to do two pit stops and be leading an ultra competitive class is a there's a story to be told there from that car that's for sure and they're leading it by 30 seconds as well so as long as nothing goes wrong uh, they've uh, got a, um, a really good chance of bringing home the race victory here and becoming another new winner. And as you said, they had that stop go penalty, didn't they, earlier on we're hearing. And so that's what, uh, that has, uh, yeah, that's quite a fight back for them. And they are leading the way and looking likely to take the victory. It's rare these days that you see, particularly GT4, decided by anything like that sort of margin. The biggest winning margin so far this year in GT4 was at Spa, 21.7 seconds. But that doesn't really do that race justice. It should have been about 0.7 of a second had the TF Sport and the Tom and McLaren not made contact. Back to the battle for fourth place overall then. Johnny Cocker still ahead of Phil Keane. Phil Keane doing everything he has to here though. He's applying the pressure. He's sitting right underneath the rear wing of the 69 car. Teammate or not, if he can force a mistake out of that 69 car, that is good news. Yeah, definitely. And Lynn's still there as well, so you can't see it from his camera board. Something that's great for my OCD. The gap between Keane and Cocker is 3.4 tenths, and the gap between Lind and Keane was 3.4 tenths. So that couldn't be any closer between three cars. So there's six tenths covering these three guys. And this, this battle's raging on. As you said, the mistake is probably the only way that's going to happen now, because Cocker's worked out, oh, that's a good look. And, I'm surprised how open Cocker left the door there. That's a huge amount of trust and respect, I would say, from Cocker to Keane, knowing, mm. I'll give you the gap. If you think you can take it, then brilliant, but I don't think you can, and I don't think you're going to take us out of the race by doing a, an ill-time move. As just out of the comms box, you see the McLaren GT3 floating two cars. There's a lot to be watching here, and I think, yeah, the, the best opportunity for Phil is going to be into Druid as we see this. It's all, almost like a fake Fast and Furious <laughs> movie, how cars have to dart around and stuff, but, yeah, it's, it's hard and fast for all of them, and there's a a mistake somewhere in here, I think. I just don't know who from. They're also being caught rapidly by Tom Onslow Cole, Nicky Team, and Seb Morris, uh, who are now within a second of these three. So this is about to become a six car fight for fourth position, incorporating the top two in the championship as well. And none of the other cars in that battle really are realistic championship contenders anymore. So they've got nothing to lose. They might be able to go on the attack and find a way past these Lamborghinis. Out over the curb they go. A sea of GT4 traffic in front of them. And they're heading to the worst part of the circuit on which to catch them. Out on the ground, really. Johnny Cocker from the outside to the inside. The Century Motorsport car thought about turning in and thankfully decided against it. That's the 43 example of uh, Nathan Freak, that is, isn't it, in the car this weekend. Good to see Nathan back in the British GT Championship. Johnny Cocker, this could be this could be Phil Keane's opportunity, though, if he gets held up by a bat marker up the inside into Sheen Curve. And every bat marker that Cocker goes past, Keane has to go with him, doesn't he? He has to stay lapped onto that rear bumper because if he gets that little gap of maybe half a second, three quarters of a second, they're so evenly matched, it'll take Phil a while to get that time back. Yeah, and it's just the ease of getting past the GT4 car as well. If he can make that like a Lamborghini limousine as just two long cars rather than two separate ones, the work's being done for him. And it's easier for the GT4 as well. You can just leave the door open once rather than having to worry about two separate overtakes. And yeah, Cocker's whipping it out, in and out. He's on the outside this time. Last time we saw the inside, but He's just having to be so dynamic. There's no hard or fast rule with traffic because there's too many variables when you catch them, speed difference, what driver, what car they're in. But yeah, we're seeing 
three Lamborghinis, nose to tail. And yeah, as I said, I think there's, there's almost got to be a mistake here. The buckle and the pressure. I, unfortunately, going back a few years, was in a similar position to Johnny Cocker and had Alexander Sims behind me, who were both in Z4s back then. And I was like this for 50 minutes, and unfortunately, I ran a bit wide on a bit of fluid and lost the position. And so I know what this pressure can feel like, and it it's just it builds and builds and builds, and you just hope it doesn't explode while the, uh, the green flag's out, and it happened somewhere time after the checkered flag. Johnny Cocker will be having flashbacks to this race 12 months ago when he was defending as if his life depended on it for much of the, his uh, stint in the race then. Only that, that time it was for the race lead with Johnny Adam breathing down his neck trying to take the victory and indeed did succeed in the end in taking the victory away from him. What would have been Johnny and uh, Sam the Hand's first win together. This time around though, it's an even more significant uh, car that he's got to keep behind him. Dive to the inside of the number 15 Multimatic Mustang, which is still running a solid fourth in GT4 at the moment. Uh, some 8.9 seconds behind anyone else and eight seconds ahead of the fifth place car as well. So they're looking secure for a top four finish in the GT4 category. I think there's a big drift from Prio there, that was cool. Um, I think that fourth position is a championship winning position yeah. uh, without calling it too early because he's going to get more points than any of his rivals around him. And he goes into Donington penalty three as we touched on earlier. So he has got everything he needs in his armory at Donington to get whatever result he needs. Um, so I think that is a very calculated, good drive by Prio and the Multimatic team there. Um, I think this six car battle is going to really hot up now. This lap, we've got all six GT3 cars with no traffic. Um, we're seeing Onslow Cole with great pace in that Mercedes, going to be on the back of Lind either this lap or the one after. And it's going to be interesting to see how quickly it's going to be. So we have the 62 on, on view, and it'd be amazing to actually get a bit more insight onto exactly how they've done it. And uh, I don't know if Andy can uh, work out their secrets of success. Joe, I believe most of it is luck, would you say? I mean, what a, what a remarkable, I've never seen that, in fact, in racing before. Just tell us how you got to the front. Um, I don't really know. From in the car, it was all a bit mental. We got, you know, I was told on the radio, we got a stop-go penalty for something that happened on the grid. Um, these things happen, but yeah, we'd served it. We got lucky with the first safety car. The safety car let us through, and we ended up with a massive uh, gap to the car behind. Um, so we came out in P7 again. All right, crack on, head down, just got going, and then, we boxed as the safety car came out, and I think we've beaten the safety car, and we currently have a hefty lead, so it's quite a weird feeling. I don't really know where, where to, how to feel about it, but yeah, we're, we're leading. Will's got, Will's got a nice gap, and yeah, bring it up. Well, best of luck to you. I mean, it's, it's one way to do it, isn't it? Yeah. We'll catch up with you at the end, pot potentially. Right. Good luck. Uh, back to you guys. Well, we've seen late heartbreak for teams already this year in GT4. Remember back to Snetterton, it looked as though the uh, uh, Mercedes was going to take a dominant victory. The Team Parker car, Nick Jones and Scott Mulvan, and it uh, had uh, problems within the last 10 minutes or so, I seem to recall. So uh, it's never over until it's over. It really is the old cliche, but particularly in long distance racing, and it is absolutely the case. So, second place McLaren on your screen, still with that bodywork flapping at the back of the car. Still only three tenths clear of Mitchell. Now, this is a really impressive stint, this, from Mitchell, because he's a silver driver. In front of him is Rob Bell, a pro, a full-on pro driver. Bell should be quicker. Now, I know that car's got a bit of damage, but fair, fair play here to Jack Mitchell. He's driving the wheels off that BMW, isn't he? Yeah, it's definitely. It's been a, a difficult year for Jack without being too hard on him, because how well we saw him race last year in GT4, a champion. He's a quick guy, races out in China as well. He's this has definitely been one of the best stints we've seen from him. It's great they can keep up there, and that's going to be potentially an overall podium at worst, I would say, because as you said, his, his pace compared to Bell is good. That long wheelbase, like the Bentley, that BMW will really feel lovely out on the fast-flowing corners. You'll be able to throw it in and just commit to it. Um, so it'll be, again, interesting to see how that goes. I think it was a great interview, by the way, down with Alex Toff Jones, how uh, honest and open he was with it. Normally you hear a racing driver when they're leading, it's all down to them and kale and Himalayan salt that they have for breakfast and all that rubbish. But you sometimes just need luck, and luck's better than anything else. It's better than skill if it gives you a 30-second lead in your class. No, absolutely. That's, uh, that's quite right. So uh, on board with the 11 car then, through clear weight. Martin Plowman still leading Pro-Am in GT4, but uh, only about three seconds clear of Michael Broadhurst now. He's doing everything he can to try and bring that gap down. Here, the two Lamborghinis turn through 30s, so if things 
uh, finish as they are now, the 69 car would be six and a half points clear of the 47 car in the championship. Is King going to have a go down into Hawthorns here? Yes, he is going to be inside, but the door is closed. That was the first genuine attempt, I think, really, that Keane's had to get through. Adam Ballon must be having kittens, Andy J. Okay. Yeah, sure. Should we go to the screen? Let's, yeah. let's, I'm, taking, I'm taking Adam to the screen because I wanted to try and see what's happening. Um, Adam, let's, Which screen? Let's, let's try and get it back up there. Just talk to me about exactly what's going on in your mind right now because there's a right old scrap and it's between the teammates. Yeah, there's a proper scrap there. Well, the first thing is we've got to try and catch the, uh, the beamer in front, basically. That's, that's the main thing. Get on there and then get really into the mix. How hard is that whilst you're having to watch your mirrors as, <laughs> as much as he's having to? It's hard. It's super hard. But, you know, um, these just guys... Just have a look at the screen now. You can see just how tight it is. Uh, it's, I mean, then nose to tail, the three Lambos are just absolutely on each other. I mean, you know, they're all great drivers and it's just, it's, it's going to be like that till the end of the race. I mean, I was expecting a lot of nerves coming to see you, but you're actually loving this, aren't you? Yeah, no, actually I am. I, I really enjoy my stint and this is great to watch and I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. It makes it all the more fun. Come on, be a betting man. What, what do you think is going to happen? Um, I think it'll stay like this, actually. If I really had to bet, I think it will stay like this. But it's so tough to pass here. Um, but I hope it. I hope it changes. Phil's going to show you a clip of this in about two days' time. Going, yeah, you were wrong. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Adam. Good luck. Cheers, Enjoy it. You. Cheers. Brilliant stuff. Well, Phil Keane then applying the pressure here and. Uh, he is, he, this is so significant, this positional change is so significant that for both drivers, there are uh, three points different between finishing fourth and fifth, and those three points are gonna make the world of difference as far as who takes home the title at the end of the year. Tolman McLaren's at play here, albeit they're a lap apart, the four car of James Dorlin still running in second position. See, out of the window, there's a slow McLaren going down the Cooper Strait as well, which is, I fear, the Bolf car in GT4. So, yes, there it is, the number 20 car. Now, this is of significance for the Pro-Am uh, contest in GT4. What are you seeing on the right rear corner there? Just a, it looks a bit gravelly, that rear right, the tyre wall, and it's not rotating in a particularly uh, symmetrical... Uh, that's not what is it? Symmetrical is a better way of saying it. Uh, fashion. Uh, windows down as well, which isn't always a good sign. So he's looped into the pit lane, so it won't be a problem for the guys on track, but... Yeah, hard to say what had gone there, but something on the rear right wasn't looking particularly puck up. I think that if the number 11 car, Martin Plowman, wins Pro-Am, now that that car's out, that will hand the championship to them because they were half a point clear. They win their class and Bath don't finish or don't score, which looks like it might be the case. Looks as though Kelvin Fletcher and Martin Plowman might wrap up the Pro-Am title in GT4 with a race to spare, but there are still 21 minutes to go. And the way this race has gone, I am counting no chickens just yet, but that's just another little uh, story for us potentially to chase in the last part of the race. Probably good not to count chickens at Brands Hatch, I guess, as <laughs> the link there. Uh, very but, good. Uh, that's uh, very uh, going to be hard for that Balfe team to take. I think Johnson and O'Brien have done a good job, but for me this year, Fletcher's just upped his game so much. I think uh, as an amateur, he's doing really, really well. And overtaking is, is easy, but then it's also as easy to clip mirrors, take a wheel off, and he's proven he's a, he's a proper, proper racer. This battle doesn't really seem like it's changing too much. Looks like, if I'm being a bit of a Rob Bell fanboy, he's probably got a nothing reserve where he's just keeping Mitchell at an arm's length but maybe realises he hasn't got 11 seconds of pace to catch Johnny Adam in 20 minutes. So he's probably using his senior years and his experience to kind of just manage his situation and take the best. As we see the two Tolman cars, the lead car is a, a lap ahead. So uh, we have a car off at Druids. That oh, it's is, not, is it? No. It's the leader in GT4. Would you believe it? Off at Druids has got Will Moore. They had a 30-second lead in GT4, and they're out of the race. I can't believe it. That is heartbreak. Uh, the only thing, quickly, if um, we can take a, a replay. Again, Ooh. Rear's gone quite early there. It could be contact with the amount of cars around him. If I was Tolman here, I'd be getting them to swap their cars around for position. Potentially that car behind a lap down. Mm. If the, the guy lets him go, if Dorlin lets him go, and the GT3 leaves in the right place, he can get his lap back. Yeah. So there's a lot of play here. Again, we don't know if there's going to be a safety car or not here. We see a replay of the just coming into shots. We're trying to see if there's any damage on the rear right or anything. Doesn't nothing obvious for me, but just 
I'd say there's got to have been contact there for a car to spin off that ferociously. And I can't believe how uh, it's horrible being in this commentary box. It's like those guys should have won easily. And even though it was luck, they almost deserve it of a kind of story like that. And that is, yeah, race over. I think the smoke is probably just like a brake line or something that's got a bit of rubber on it. I don't think it's too, uh, too aggressive in terms of a fire or anything. I think this is more likely to be a safety car than some of the other incidents we've seen there, because whilst there is a live snatch vehicle at Druids, and it does appear to have moved, um, it's it's very close to the edge of the road, that, but we'll wait and see if there is a safety car. That, as you said, changes everything. And the point Joe is making, though, they are going to do it under live snatch, according to the timing screen. Um, so the, the point Joe is making is that if the Tolman cars had swapped positions, then they may possibly have got the number five car, the car that's championship contention, it's lap back. But uh, it doesn't look like that's going to happen now if they can clear this under live snatch. There are the Tolman cars. You'd think they'd swap them anyway, really, just in case. But uh, uh, the four car, which is now leading the GT4 category, would you believe, of James Dorling. Now, they will be thinking, right, what's going to go wrong this time? Because every time this number four car gets itself in position to do well, either win or a podium in GT4, something seems to go wrong. They will be praying that these next 18 minutes go past pretty quickly. Yeah, I think the, the only opposite to keeping the top cars in this order is that Collard can be a rear gunner to the HHC McLaren in shop there. I would say a championship's a lot more important than a race win for Vanity. So, yeah, interesting to keep it there. Jordan has obviously realised that flashing the teammate isn't the right thing to do after the dressing down I gave him at the Spa, so at least he's learnt that. But, yeah, McDonald looks like he's probably got the pace of the two Tolman cars at the at the moment. So if Collard can sit there and just be a rear gunner for Dorlin to kind of protect his lead, that would be an interesting dynamic for the last 15 minutes as we see the Century 42 BMW in looks like uh, potentially an engine issue or something, but uh, those guys were already a lap down, so nothing uh, too important in terms of the, the race victory here as we see Morris all over the back of team. And for me, this is the first time we haven't seen Nicky charge through the field. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to say why, but it must be a mixture of BOP and maybe a bit of setup on that car. Mark Farmer's obviously have to have a few more laps each weekend to get himself up to speed, so that means that Nicky will get a few less. But, yeah, this battle is still going to turn into this potentially four-car battle now as Lind has dropped off the back of the two Barwell cars and they've kind of left it as there. So Keeney now doesn't have to worry about Lind behind him. He can concentrate on Cocker, but as these teammates are going for championship, that this move needs to be 100% on for Phil Keane to do it. And it's... It's not going to win in the championship, but it can only lose in the championship if it goes wrong. It's that kind of old adage, unfortunately. Yeah, 100%. So uh, let's see how this one works out. And also whether uh, or not Tom Onslow Cole can gain an extra position here. This is the five for sixth place we're watching with Lind, Onslow Cole, Team and uh, Morris all in a very expensive queue of cars with Lamborghini, Mercedes, Aston Martin and Bentley together. Once again, showing the great variety out there. Uh, in the British GT Championship, particularly in the GT3 ranks at the moment. But this does now free up these two championship leading cars, the two championship contending cars, the two Marwell machines, to do battle now for that all-important fourth position. Up the hill they go. Callum McLeod, by the way, a few laps ago, set the new fastest lap on 126.525. That's fairly impressive, given the amount of traffic they're all having to deal with out on the circuit right now. Uh, car number nine, Jack Mitchell in third, being warned about track limits at this corner, Graham Hill Bend. So Phil Keane had that bit of a dive up the inside into Hawthorne a few laps ago. Apart from that, really, his only other opportunities seem to have come in the traffic. And right now, there is rather a lack of traffic. They just negotiated the uh, century car that had just been into the pit lane for an extra pit stop for some reason. So apart from that, it's fairly clear track around them. Lind, though, is having to defend now from the very pacey Mercedes of Tom Onslow Cole. Takes the wide line into Hawthorne, tries to come back to the late apex to get the inside at... Uh, at uh, Westfield. In the end, though, the gap is not there. And Dennis Linden, WPI Motorsport Lamborghini, hanging on for all he's worth here. Through the dip, on Cole again looks to the inside. They're going to get held up by the BMW through Sheen. And this will now continue to stack everyone up. It brings Nicky Team into play, and this could well... Oh, yeah, that was a good move there by uh, Dennis Lind. Went around the outside of the BMW, and Onslow Cole, in the end, is the one that loses out in that little exchange with the back markers. And so he will... Uh, now have to watch his mirrors to try and keep Nicky Team at bay. Nicky Team currently running in eighth position then with Seb Morris right behind him. Now, third place Matt, Jack Mitchell, is being caught here by the Cocker and Keane pairing as well. They're about 
uh, three and a half seconds behind. We'll keep one eye on that gap because Mitchell's dropped back now from Rob Bell in the McLaren slightly, and he's being caught by the two Lamborghinis. So they're sort of spurring each other on here, and they're putting in some really, really quick lap times. Yeah, Mitchell's on that track limit warning as well, so that might be costing a tenth or two each lap, not being able to use as we see Lynn have a huge slide through turn three. All these guys right on the limit. These guys, uh, I think this lap will catch about six GT4 cars as well, so yeah. we've got the biggest group of GT4 cars just out of shot, so that's going to spice it up a little bit as well. As um, Yeah, I think we're we're close to kind of working out where everyone is in their pecking order with ten minutes going. It's been that sort of hard to work out what the pace is as... Uh, Bannon looks on, uh, hoping that uh, his kind of run of luck goes back to how it started the year and how Snetterton went, really. Phil Keane may feel that he is quicker than Johnny Cocker, and therefore if he can get through, he might be able to go after Jack Mitchell as well and score some more points. But right now, I think his main concern is just getting past this car. This is a championship-leading overtake. If he can make this move stick, they will lead the points going to Donington Park. If he can't, the 69 car will into clearways. Keane is closer than ever now. It shows that he's quick because he's able to stay with Cocker, isn't he? Usually with the dirty air, you would naturally fall a tenth or so back, but he's staying right with him, so he must have speed over Cocker. It's just so hard to pass that he can't show that, can he? Once he gets through, if he gets through, you'd imagine he could probably pull away. Yeah, definitely. And it could be as much as three or four tenths a lap if he's quicker, but that will never be shown until he can completely do what he wants. He won't be able to get on the throttle as early as he wants out of Druids there. They have to break a bit earlier everywhere so he doesn't have any chance of hitting the back of his teammate. So they're going to get these GT4 cars coming out of Surtees the next corner. They might clear two or three of them on the straight, but then they're going to be in the worst bit of the track for the others, Hawthorns and Westfield potentially. Um, without starting a conspiracy theory, I just think fourth place is a great position to finish going into the last round. No pit stop penalty. If you finish third, yes, you get those more points, but you've got 10 seconds extra in the pit. So oh, I'd be quite happy if you didn't hit the KTM, but also they did get the 10 second penalty. So the KTM's hurt him. That's going to be a second now to Cocker. And let's see how quickly he catches up. Hard to say if it's a true reflection of pace or Cocker just gets a bit more traffic because we see him cutting through the, uh, the Mercedes GT4 there of Broadhurst. And it's just so hard for these guys to make the right call. Interestingly, Broadhurst has caught Plowman as well. Now the GT4 Pro-Am leader. Remember, if Prow Plowman doesn't win the class, he doesn't win the championship. Run, Nose yeah. to tail. Phil Keane's got a really good run down to clearways, but is there going to be a gap on the inside? There is, Send but he it. can't quite get there. <laughs> Joe Osborne says he should have sent it. Phil Keane decides he doesn't want to risk taking his teammates out, but he is all over him, and this could be his last chance. This is the biggest group of traffic that they will have to deal with, probably now, for the remainder of the race. And they're side by side in front. Cocker goes to the inside. Keane goes with him. The BMW just about sees them coming in time. And it, this is so tense. The championship is on the line now between these two cars. And still, Johnny Cocker has not put a foot wrong. What a stint he's put in here. He might not be as quick as Keane, but my word, he knows how to defend. Yeah, not a single mistake here. And I, I think you've called it right. I think that was his last chance. I think there's not enough GT4s grouped together now for the last 11 minutes to really kind of get that disruption that we've just seen there. It's literally like just dropping in a grenade and watching it go off and see which bits fall off. I think they will catch Mitchell, but I don't think they're going to have the pace, and I don't think the, the necessity to take that third place and pit stop punches. as we see team go three wide. They're going to split that. I think Conzo Cole is the guy who'd rather be in that position. Let's see if he can hold it on the inside into Hawthorne's. Looks like the team is going to have to tuck in behind. But yeah, as we see, that grenade still going off all the way through the back of this pack. Yes, because it's not just about those championship contenders, but this lot are also fighting for positions within the last 10 minutes or so of the race. And as we saw at Spa last time out, these battles will rage quite literally down to the final corner of the final lap. Nicky Team wants to try and get himself another position if he can. Tom Onslow Cole is currently occupying the seventh place in which Nicky would rather like to finish if he can. Uh, Nicky Team and Mark Farmer's uh, best finish of the season so far as well. They had that uh, podium, didn't they, back at Silverstone? Second place finish there. But apart from that, it's been rather a trying season for that pairing. Out across the start finish line, they come then into the final 10 minutes of what has been an enthralling penultimate round of the British GT Championship of 2019. And still, so many positions, so many championship points are hanging in the balance here with plenty that could still change in the final part of the race. That's the uh, 97 car. Is this for position? Yes, it is. This is crucial. This is Nathan Freak that he's trying to get past and has gone past now. So Tom Canning moves into fourth position. That means that he will now score 18 points rather than 
15 points. So that's a gain of four extra points. So that makes a difference now. They'll be about 11 points off the championship lead going into the final round at Donington Park, if my maths are correct. So the 97 car, that was a really important move that they made. But now they're 21 seconds behind Seb Priya. So I think that's the best it's going to get for Canning. Not bad, though, considering the time penalty and the fact we've had two safety cars. Yeah, it's hard to say exactly uh, where they would be because they've had 20 seconds, but the safety cars punch them. But they're about 23 seconds off the lead, which is what you expect as we see the GT3 leader catching the GT4 leaders with that Tolman car in the middle of the, the three McLarens, not for position. But yeah, so we have to work out pretty much exactly where the cars need to be as we see Johnny Adam. We have a pretty nice scenario here. You can see he hasn't overtaken him because he doesn't have to. He's got at least 12 seconds to Rob Bannon's second, so he can take his time. Uh, and it's going to interest see if uh, McDonald in that HHC car is going to try and use a GT3 car to open the door on the uh, on the top of cars potentially. Looks like he's a little bit too far back for his uh, position going potential. It goes to show though the sort of risk taking that everyone else is having to do in the traffic because Johnny Adam, as you said, backed out of overtaking those cars because he felt it was too risky. At no point have we seen Johnny Cocker back out of overtaking a back mark because he thought he, he knows it's too risky, but he has no choice, has to go for it. Whereas Johnny Adam's got this 8.3 second lead, he can coast it home now and really doesn't need to start, start throwing caution to the wind. This result will move them well and truly into contention, but they will have then, if they win, the 20-second penalty at Donington. We'll get to Donington when we get to Donington, though. Right now, there's still eight minutes of racing left. Ron Bell looking good in second place now, still about a couple of seconds ahead of Jack Mitchell, who's 2.2 ahead of the two Barwell Lamborghinis, still in the same order. Cocker ahead of Keane, then Lind, Onslow, Cole, Team and Morris, with Callum McLeod only a second and a half behind them now. Back on board with Keane, another few back markers in front now, and I think one of those cars yeah, one of those cars is Jack Mitchell then that's really getting held up now. So if they do catch Jack... Really oh, wide. Oh, that's the Mustang, isn't it? That's the 19... No, that was the 15 car. That was Seb Priya running wide out of Sterling's. If they catch Jack Mitchell and Jack starts defending, what effect might that have on the dynamic between the two Lamborghinis? So the best chance for Phil is that, yes, Jack starts defending from Johnny Cocker and Johnny gets held up and Phil can either just do a simple round the outside or potentially gets a cutback with a bit more momentum. It then depends if Lynn gets on the back of Keane, because then Keane becomes hunted as well. So it's, yeah, the dynamic, the, I mean, they're definitely going to catch him, mm. even this lap. The, the drop-off, I would say, for Mitchell, 30 extra kilos in that car, because it's a silver-silver combination, I think is really coming to the floor now that he's having all that extra weight hurting his brakes and his tyres, uh, most importantly. And I think that would just mean Rob is safe, and Rob will be able to, uh, in the McLaren, be similar to Johnny with the traffic. We just see... Johnny is so decisive. I think that's been his his biggest kudos in this race. And every move we've been seeing, had the privilege of seeing, it's been bang on. Every GT4 car is ignoring exactly what he's going to do. And actually feels then on the back foot because he's not sure if the GT4 is going to react the same way as it did to Johnny. So, yeah, I think this is going to be interesting with Mitchell potentially holding them up. More GT4 traffic. That's the 57 HHC car. So that, this is, these are the GT4 leaders now going another lap down to the... Uh, battle for what well, is now essentially third place in GT3 and that was another decisive move with barely an inch to spare and Keane just has to lift off the throttle momentarily that just cost him a tenth or so going out of Sheen curve but then in the next corner Cocker possibly will get delayed rather by the GT4 race leading number four car the Tottenham Motorsport machine but it's not quite over yet they'll have some clear track after this though and Keane does now get up the inside of the final GT4 car and that might be about it actually for traffic now for the rest of the race the whole indie circuit ahead of them is pretty clear now GT4 traffic so now it's a straight race and so possibly that actually does now favour Johnny Cocker unless he in a way he doesn't really want to catch Chap Mitchell now because that might actually start delaying him and uh, force the uh, the pressure back onto him from uh, from Phil Keane there's Rob Bell then, second position, and another what could have been for the McLaren, another near miss as far as getting that car onto the top step of the podium. They are eight seconds off the leader, but another good result on the cards. It's not the biggest pass in the world, but McLaren has done a sterling job here to get on the back of Morris, so that would be a fight for ninth position, which might not sound so glamorous, but that is an amazing fight back from Callum. That's just pure pace that's brought him back up there, fastest lap of the race after inheriting the car that had been through the gravel with uh, Ian Loggy through Paddock Hill. So actually, I'd say the BOP has to look pretty good here because we've got 10 cars that are all 
could be very tight together if it hadn't have been for those safety cars as well. So, yeah, I think Donington's going to be a, a real nail-biter. <laughs> You're telling me. I don't think my nerves can take the remaining five minutes of this race, let alone another 120 of them at the Donington Decider in September. This, though, is not over yet. We saw an overtake for the victory here 12 months ago inside the final five minutes. Are we going to see an overtake maybe for the championship lead between the two Lamborghinis in the dying moments of the race? Well, there's no more traffic for them to deal with for the time being. It's a straight-up fight, and lap time-wise, it is a 28-2 for Mitchell, a 28-0. 4.5 for Cocker and a 0 0.47 for Keane. So Keane was a whole two one thousand slower than Cocker on the previous occasion, but it's been much that way pretty much for the last 45 minutes or so. Lamborghinis, though, will have parts of the circuit where they're maybe a little stronger than the BMW, and it seems to be the indie part of the track where the mid-engine Lamborghini, a little bit more nimble maybe, has the edge, and that really is where most of the overtaking opportunities are. Yeah, definitely, and I think the BMW's just got that little bit more poke, so let's watch out the corner. Although it doesn't have the traction, I think he's just simply got the power, and you can see him pulling away now, even with Cocker in the slipstream, so I think it's going to be very hard for these Lamborghinis to do anything about that BMW, considering where his strengths are as we flick straight back to Keane. And I think Johnny is a little concerned about Keane's top speed into Hawthorne's. Every time now, he's just half covering it. It's not a full defence, but it's middle of the road, hedging his bets. If he needs to move right to defend, he can. Uh, but then if the attack doesn't come, he can take slightly more optimal racing line, moving back to the left so he can carry more speed. Uh, yeah, I think this is going to be pretty difficult for the Lambos to do anything about this BMW. I think it's just got enough in reserve. If we have another 10 minutes, I might change my mind. OK, well, that's uh, certainly what uh, Jack Mitchell will want to hear because, again, he doesn't particularly care about the championship battle that's going on around him. He just wants to try and get Century Motorsports first podium of the year, is it not? Yes, because they uh, certainly that car has not been on the podium. The Neither is the number three. So, yeah, this would be their first podium of what has been at times a pretty torrid season. Out of paddock they go then, and on this occasion, Mitchell appears to have pulled clear once again. What is happening, though, is Mike Ligo is starting to reel the two Barwell cars in again, and he's bringing with him his friends, Tom Onslow Cole and Nicky Team, with Seb Morris having now dropped back slightly into the clutches, rather, of Callum McLeod. So we basically got from third place back to tenth place, an eighth car, the bulk, basically, of the GT3 field together. Phil Keane keeps on showing his nose, keeps taking that early apex, just trying to distract Johnny Cocker with some drivers. That flash of colour in the mirrors can force you to miss your breaking point, turn in a bit late, but that's not going to work on Johnny Cocker, surely. I wouldn't have thought so. I think it, the, the positive it is doing for Phil is it kind of desensitizes. Oh, he's <coughs> sorry, nearly died there. Um, <laughs> desensitised Johnny Cocker um, to him showing the nose. So when he does make his move, Johnny might go, well, he's shown me his nose 50 mm. times in this race, so it's going to be the same as the others okay. that haven't equated to an overtake. So. I think that is probably the only positive of Phil showing his nose all the time. He knows Johnny won't be forced into a mistake that easily, but it just kind of covers his hand a little bit. It bluffs a little bit more hidden. Um, as we see, the, the clock's interesting. I think we're going to squeeze an extra lap at the end of this. I think Johnny Adam will finish with about 10 seconds uh, to go. So we should get this plus one more lap, I think, to go. Right, OK, so Johnny Adam then out of uh, Druids he goes and uh, down into Graham Hill Bend. Meanwhile, uh, there are 37 and a half points between 96 and 7 in the GT3 Silver. So if things finish as they are now, because Glingetti and Ryan Ratcliffe are out of the race, it does look as though Optimum Motorsport in their 96 Aston Martin, whilst they have possibly had to wave goodbye to their overall championship hopes. They would clinch the GT3 Silver Championship if things finish as they are now, uh, because whilst they're running all the way down in 11th place, they are still second in that particular class. So we're going to see at least one championship wrapped up, probably two, I think, as far as the Pro-Am in GT4 is concerned. Johnny Cocker actively defending that time into Hawthorne, which we haven't necessarily seen on uh, previous laps. So. He's feeling the heat still, and I suppose he's just making absolutely sure that Keane can't get up the inside, all the time knowing that if he successfully defends, that will back Keane up into uh, Dennis Lind behind and maybe take a bit of the pressure off of him. So Cocker trying every trick in the book here to ensure that he hangs on to this fourth place, and with it, the points lead going to Donington Park. The final lap, though, is about to begin because Johnny Adam has just come across the start-finish line with five seconds left on the clock. Onto the final lap of this penultimate round of the championship. What a two hours of racing it's been. 
the race victory looks fairly secure now for Johnny Adam. You go as far as to say that Rob Bell in second is pretty much in the bag as well. The big question is what happens from third through to tenth and the um, impact that might have on the championship. There's Josh Smith. You probably dare watch the uh, screens at the moment for fear of seeing that number four McLaren run into some sort of a problem, as it always seems to. But right now, James Dorlin does enjoy a half a second advantage over Dean McDonald in the GT4 lead. Jack Mitchell, a bit slow off Graham Hill Bend. He has to go to the inside of the Invictus Racing. Uh, Invictus Games Racing Jaguar there, but as they all go in on the inside line, there's no real gap there for Keane, who is right underneath the rear wing. One last chance here then, one last go that he can have down into Hawthorne, and he is alongside, and he's going to go for it around the outside. This is for the championship lead. Phil Keane has his nose in front, surely. Oh, he's done it! Phil Keane's gone right around the outside and takes the championship lead away from, and he could lose more places because here comes Dennis Lind on the inside and Tom Onslow Cole as well. It's all unraveling for the 69 Lamborghini on the last lap of the race, and yet again, just as in Spa, you have to keep watching these races right down to the final moment. Through goes Nicky Team as well. All of a sudden for the 72 Lamborghini, they will have a very comfortable championship margin going to the final race of the year. But it will be over this car that will take second place in the championship with another race victory for Johnny Adam and Graham Davidson. What a finish that was. It will be second place for Rob Bell in the McLaren and it will be third place after a last lap move for the incredible Phil Keane who gets with it the championship lead as well. Uh, what a, a fourth place, sorry for Keane. Fifth place for Lynn, sixth on Slow Cole, seventh Nicky Team and Johnny Cocker drops all the way down to eighth place on the halfway round the final lap. I cannot believe what I've just seen, and it's not over yet either, because in GT4 it's still going right down to the wire, but it looks as though it's going to be a first ever victory in British GT. Finally, for James Dorlin and Josh Smith, who have had to endure one of a, a season to forget, quite frankly, up until this point. They've had the speed, they've just not had the look, and here they come. They're finally going to get a race victory. James Dorlin brings it home and wins in GT4 with Dean McDonald less than half a second back. They're elated down at Tolman Motorsport. Well, the sister car has had all the good luck this year and on this occasion it was their turn finally to make it onto the top step of the podium right this is the gt4 pro am leader and this i think might be enough for martin plowman and kelvin fletcher to wrap up the gt4 pro am championship they were half a point clear of michael o'brien and graham johnson coming into this race who have not finished plowman is going to come through and score 37 and a half points he'll be 38 ahead which means that provisionally they are the champions in gt4 GT4 Pro-Am with an, another victory, their second victory of the year and their fifth podium appearance in GT4 Pro-Am and they will be rather pleased with that as well. Michael Broadhurst at the end dropped to just over a second behind but I reckon subject to confirmation etc etc, basically until someone who can count better than I can confirms it, I reckon they've done enough to take the Pro-Am Championship and they will actually still be in contention, I reckon, mathematically for the overall GT4 Championship, but it is all provisional because, of course, there are still uh, things that could change, but uh, certainly it looks good for them. Well, Joe, that was rather dull and uneventful, really, wasn't it? Not much happened there. Yes, yeah, sorry, I just dozed off happened. <laughs> I'm glad you were talking then. That, I mean, that was the best overtake I've ever seen around Brands Hatch, ever. When he was going on the outside of Cocker down to Hawthorne's, I was like, oh, that's cool, he's, he's, shown his, uh, he's shown his nose and his tent. But for that to come off, that was... That deserves to win the championship. There you go, I said it. That and was amazing. You're absolutely right. And with so much on the line as well, if that had gone wrong, we would have been having a completely different conversation now. What a move, what a race, what a win for Johnny Adam and Graham Davidson. Then they are your winners. Sean Bell from Rob Bell second, Jack Mitchell and Angus Fender are third and win the Silver Cup in that race. Phil Keen and Adam Ballon come home fourth after a sensational battle with their teammates. Fifth place for Dennis Lind and Mike Ligo. Sixth, Tom Onslow Cole and Richard Neary. Seventh, Mark Farmer and Nicky Team with Sam Dehan and Johnny Cocker down to 8th at the flag. Seb Morris and Rick Parfit to ninth. Callum McLeod and Ian Loggy 10th. In GT4, by the way, Josh Smith and James Dolan, as we said, took the victory with Dean McDonald and Callum Poynton taking a crucial second placed finish then to uh, move to, I think, about... Well, they're certainly going to be in contention still for the title going to the final round of the season at Donington Park. Second place in GT4... Uh, sorry, third place in GT4 went to Seb Prio, though, and Scott Maxwell, the points leader, so they will still hold a healthy advantage going to the last round, whilst the 97 TF Sport car 
will not have a penalty to serve, and they still finished fourth and scored some good points, with Nathan Freak bringing the Century Motorsport car number 43 back for a top five finish in GT4. So a good day all round for BMWs and Century Motorsport after, as we've said, a season they'd probably rather forget up until this point. Well, I need to go and have a lie down in a, in a cold, dark room, I think, after that. That was phenomenal stuff. And John E. Adam, ah, we're going to have a points graphic, I believe. So this will confirm this is how it looks going to the last round. So Adam Ballon and Phil Keane will be six points clear. So that's about two positions on the trap, basically, that could make all the difference going to the last round. Graham Davison and Johnny Adam will be second, but will serve a penalty because they won today, whilst Cocker and Dehan drop down to third position, 11 and a half points off the championship lead. Uh, and I think they're the only three that are in contention. Now, I don't think that Rob Bell and Sean Balfour are close enough. That's more than 37 and a half points. So it will be a three-way shootout for the championship at the Donington Decider in September. GT4 championship-wise, there we are, Maxwell and Priya 125, 12 points clear of Ash Hand and Tom Canning in the 97 car with Callum Poynton and Dean McDonald on 109, uh, 125, uh, let me get the calculators back out again to work out how many are in contention. 125 minus 37.5, 87.5, the magic number. So four of them, because Jordan Collard and Lewis Proctor technically are still in contention. It'll be a four-way fight for the GT4 Championship going to the end of the season. Right, Andy J, we need to lie down. Over to you for a moment. Get the reaction from down in the pit lane. You say you, say you need a lie down, Andy, but I think Graham here is probably, well, you're ice cool now, never in doubt. Huh? Congratulations, yeah. race winner. Yeah, that's what we came here to do. Uh, simple. <laughs> Stop being so relaxed. You're, you're elated, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm telling you off I'm just, now. I'm not good at showing my excitement, really. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was a fantastic race. Um, yeah, we made some tricky moves to, to get to the front at the start and then just managed the traffic, gave Johnny the car, and, yeah, it couldn't have gone better, really. So The pair of you blitzed it. Yeah. Yeah, we, I think we both like the track, and that that counts for something and gives you a bit more confidence and speed. And uh, just delighted that you know another another good performance from start to finish, and it rights some of the wrongs that have gone now, not, uh, not that have happened this season. And nice to get another bunch of laps led and another top step on the podium. Sets you up perfectly and, for Donington, and it sets us up perfectly for Donington. Yeah. So we're ready for the the fight there and. Because of that last lap scrap in the Lambos, it puts us in a very strong position to, you know, to, to take the fight to them at Donny. So, yeah, we'll see if we can get a job done there. Despite your calm demeanour, you're over the moon, aren't you? Yes, yes, that was it. But after the, the sort of disappointment at Spa and our breaks and then my contact with the Porsche, it was, again, time to, to put things right. So. Get yourself to the podium. Huh? Thank you. Um, let's see if we can grab Kelvin. Uh, he's no, I'm afraid he's disappeared. Unfortunately, Kelvin Fletcher obviously will be elated himself uh, at having secured the pro am title. But we'll try and get him after the podium. Um, guys, I hope you've got back up for your rest because Joe and Andy, I know you're having a lovely time, but it's time to get back on the mic. I think that's. Well, we're a bit giddy up here, I think, after that. Honestly, I have never seen anything like that in my life. It's not just that that's an impossible move to pull. It's not just that it was on his teammate. But what was on the line there? If that had gone wrong for either of those two cars, I mean, it did go wrong for the 69 car, I guess, but if Phil Keane had ended up in the gravel, we would have been saying completely different things about him, wouldn't we? What are your thoughts on that move? Honestly, it's one of the best I've ever seen the Brands Hatch, if not one of the best British GT moves. I mean, right now, Phil deserves to be on his head in the barrier at Hawthorns because the audacity of that move, to go around the outside, to ask your teammate the question of, I'm going to go around the outside of you. If we make contact, I know it's my fault, but what are we going to do? Mm. Well... What a two hours of racing that was. Let's remind ourselves of some of the highlights. It was a dramatic start to the race, particularly in GT4, where the 95 car was out of it before the race even got underway. And that would rather set the tone for what was a chaotic but hugely entertaining 120 minutes of racing action. Graham Davidson was in the gravel coming out of Paddock Hill Bend, but that car would go on to have a solid first stint, whilst the stellar performance uh, Audi was in the gravel down at Hawthorne after contact from one of the HHC McLarens. In GT4 Pro-Am, it was kicking off with a brilliant move for the lead made by Kelvin Fletcher, a lead that they would not relinquish to the flag, 
and provisionally give them the championship. Glingetti was off though in spectacular fashion at Westfield after contact with an Aston Martin and simultaneously Ollie Wilkinson spun out of the lead in the Optimum Motorsport Aston Martin. They would eventually finish down in a lowly 11th place. In the melee it was a miracle that no one collected him but the safety car was thrown so that the barriers could be repaired at Westfield and the Glingetti Bentley could be recovered. Upon resumption of racing it was all go in GT4 as the 58 HHC McLaren was briefly fighting for a top five whilst the 72 Lamborghini was getting plenty of Mercedes attention from Richard Neary and Ian Loggy who then went off at Paddock Hill Bend thankfully was able to dig his way back out. Then we got to the pit stop window and the 47 car was able to come out with the race lead with Johnny Adam fairly comfortably ahead of anybody else. The uh, Mercedes, the Team Park Racing Mercedes in GT4 was shedding bodywork. That brought out another safety car and then the 58 car was one of a few cars to have problems at clearways. It spun off into the gravel trap whilst from the lead of GT4, the number 62 Aston Martin of Academy Motorsport was 30 seconds ahead when it spun at Druids. Then the move of the race, the move of the season maybe, Phil Keane round the outside of his teammate to take the championship lead going to the finale at Donington Park. You do not want to miss it. Well, the <laughs> that sort of does the race justice. I mean, there was so much more going on there that we just simply couldn't follow. But uh, now it's time for the drivers to celebrate because the podium presentation is about to get underway and a chance for the drivers to celebrate in style uh, after what was just a phenomenal race and we start then uh, with our overall top three and it was third place then that went the way finally of Century Motorsport and Jack Mitchell and uh, Dominic uh, sorry uh, the number nine car excuse me Jack Mitchell and Angus Fender on his debut in that car as well uh, managing to get himself a uh, podium finish second place another second place finish for the Bolt Motorsport squad but they'll be I think reasonably happy with the way that their uh, season has gone so far but the race winners and what a pivotal win that might be to move them to within six points of the Championship League going to Doddington Park. It's Graham Davidson and Johnny Adam then who get onto the top step of the Brands Hatch podium. Ava Hildebrand, I believe, is on hand from Sunoco to make the uh, presentations momentarily. The uh, awards for our top uh, three finishing teams. We say, Obviously, it's great for TF Sport to have won, but... They now have to carry that penalty into Donington Park. Now, as we've seen today, you can rebound from that if there are safety cars or whatnot. What situation would you rather be in now? I mean, obviously, the Lamborghini has the points lead and they know they don't have a penalty at Donington Park. The ball is very much in their court now, isn't it? Yeah, the only thing going against them is the Barwell curse of Donington uh, deciders. They've uh, they have been in championship contention three times yeah. and look like they've been in the driving seat, a few of them, and they've never come away of it. So I hope that changes. I think Ballon and Keane probably on reflection deserve it. I think the 20-second penalty for Davidson and Johnny Adam is going to be too much. They, they will need a safety car post pit stops to stand any chance. There's no way that pairing, unfortunately, is going to gain 20 seconds over um, Ballon and, and Keeney there. So I think it's going to be a tough call, but there's still three cars, and we've just seen in the last lap how much it can change. It like Johnny Cocker had done everything right, and they were going to be in the driving seat for the last round, and then suddenly we're not even contending those two guys in our top three. Uh, so it's going to be an amazing fight as we see uh, the boys spray the champagne. All seems a bit subdued, doesn't it, really? We thought they've done any work. <laughs> They're probably worn out, I'd imagine. It was hot work out there anyway, especially with the uh, extra pressure of the championship situation. But yeah, Phil Keane, the last three years in a row, has finished second in this championship. I think he's thinking it's about time that that became first. It's certainly not been for the want of trying. And this year, he does seem to have gelled really well with Adam Ballon, doesn't he? But uh, so too these three teams up there. I mean, a great news for Century Motorsport. That's all been lost in all this, hasn't it? But a great day for them. A top five in GT4 and their first GT3 podium at a circuit that I didn't necessarily expect that car to go awfully well at. No, yeah, exactly. I think it may be a bit harsh to say, but they've been kind of the steady eddies of the race. They've kind of been third for the whole thing and they've collected third place. They, they deserve it. They kept their nose clean, didn't do anything wrong. Great job by the team in the pit stop and they've got a great result, which is it's hard to do with a silver car. We saw how much I think Mitchell was struggling towards the end of the stint with that extra weight. So for them to get a podium is, is great. And maybe if those two can stay together at Donington, they can build on that. It's obviously a first time driving together, which is never easy to get a new teammate and get a podium is actually uh, very, very good. Yeah, two different driving styles as well. Maybe they're different compromise on the setup. So no, that's a good point well made. Uh, now then we move on to our next 
podium presentation then, and there will be uh, several of these. We have now the GT4 overall podium, and this will be a very happy podium, I think, for a number of reasons, really. In third place, then, another podium for Seb Prio and Scott Maxwell. That will be their third podium of the year. It's the first time they've been on the podium and not won, actually. Their other two podiums have both been victories back at Alton Park and at Donington Park. Uh, but uh, now they are on the third step of the podium this time and they bag some very handy championship points as a result. 12 points clear they will be uh, in the championship going to the final round. Uh, in second place, in contention for the title, will be Dean McDonald uh, in the 57 car with Callum Poynton. But finally, at long, long last, James Dawlin and Josh Smith have got their victory in GT4. It's been a long time coming, hasn't it? And I don't think there's anyone here who isn't happy to see them on the top step after everything that's gone wrong for them this year. Yeah, they're both great kids out of the car as well, working with them uh, relatively closely within our McLaren Driver Development Programme. They have had the worst luck out of anyone on the grid this year. So for them to have a, a, a victory like that is brilliant. It's just such a shame that it comes so late in the year and it's going to be no championship charge from them or anything like that. And actually, if you were uh, McLaren, if you were Tolman, you wanted the sister car to have that result in terms of the championship. Um, so it's going to go down to Donington, obviously, for GT4. Again, I just see uh, Maxwell and Priya in the driving seat there. They've got a 10-second penalty, but I think that the extra points they've got over second place will be enough to negate that. And it's it's been so reliable, that car as well. I don't think we've really mentioned that. It's only had one DNF, I think, where Priya dropped at Alton Park at the start of the year, and the car's just run like clockworks. Obviously, made out some big, strong American pig eye, and it just pounds around all day long, so it's happy as Larry. And seems to go well at all of the circuits, which, again, is contrary to what you might expect, really, but uh, certainly this weekend, McLaren's have gone well, obviously, second place in GT3, and two cars on the overall GT4 podium as well. This place does suit those mid-engine cars, but it wasn't necessarily Tolman that we expected, based on qualifying at least, to be spraying the winner's champagne. And I bet it might, it, I was going to say that feels good. It doesn't feel good when it goes in your eyes. It stings that stuff, but I don't really think they care. They will be uh, happy enough. It, they can spray it anywhere they want. And uh, the best feeling, honestly, is when you wake up Monday morning in that kind of confused, dizzy state, <laughs> and then suddenly you remember, oh, that happened yesterday. <laughs> that's brilliant. And unfortunately, they would have had the opposite of that many times this year mm. when they wake up Monday morning going, oh, my God, what an awful weekend we've just had. Um, so, yeah, congratulations to them. And, uh, yeah, the, the GT4 Pro-Am battle was great mm. as well. It was, it was a shame that the, the safety car split it. I know I'm going on about it. I just I know how frustrating it is when you're in that situation. Like going to play a football match and your laces are tied together. It almost makes the whole stint pointless when you're getting in a lap down. But if we've seen Fletcher and Plowman uh, tie up the championship, maybe with a bit of luck because of, um, obviously, O'Brien and Johnson retiring, uh, and that was good. Well, yeah, look, yes, but they've, they've been the team to beat, really, all year in GT4 Pro-Am, and uh, they may have only had that half a point advantage coming into this race, but uh, they won the race, and the Balfe Motorsport car wasn't really in contention, even when it retired, so they did the job, and... Well, let's see what their reaction is. Do they know? Has it been confirmed? I think it has, hasn't it? Kelvin Fletcher feels it has. He is very happy indeed, and Martin Plowman likewise. So they've scored. They're 38 points ahead now, basically, of the Balf car, and there will only be 37 and a half available at Donington Park. So either way, they win the race, and it is their uh, second win of the year. As I said, their fifth podium of the year. And they've been inside the the top 20, if you like, overall, which usually means top six or so in GT4 in every race so far this year. It's been a, a great season. And Martin Plowman, we know he's a good driver, and we always do wax lyrical about Calvin Fletcher, but I can't really stress enough how impressed I am. Again, in that stint, he was up against silver-graded drivers who should be quicker, and they weren't. Yep, he's really holding his own. He's, he's almost creating a bit of a problem with himself. Is he too good to be a bronze? <laughs> Even though he's obviously been acting his whole life, he's coming to the motorsport, in later life, I wouldn't want to say how old he is, but he's definitely a bronze. He's just working on the top of his game, and it's got to be down to the car being right, the team being right, Martin supporting him, mm. coaching him right, and getting the most out of him. And it, it's quite cool to see an amateur giving it to the kids and keeping them honest and not letting them have it all their own way. No, absolutely. And again, three different makes of car represented on the podium in GT4 Pro Am. And now they get to celebrate with the champagne as well. <laughs> Away they go. And Martin Plowman trying to get his teammate. His aim 
maybe not all that great, but then you probably can't see what he's doing. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, good stuff there from our uh, GT4 Pro. -Am. Also joining them on the podium, by the way. I know we've just been talking about them, but Fox Motorsport was second with uh, Michael Broadhurst and Mark Murphy. And in third place in GT4 uh, Pro Am uh, on their debut in the championship, Richard Meaden and Jack Roush. Uh, Jack Roush, we didn't really get to mention much, but the Roush name very familiar to any American motorsport enthusiasts out there. Great to see them on the podium as well, spraying that, uh, that lovely champagne. Yeah, he's done a good job coming into a, a new car, new team, new championship, new track is difficult. And yeah, he was certainly driving like he was in a rush. So it was good to see him uh, out there and get a podium. And they had an extra five seconds to serve in the pit lane because it was a new driver line. If you, if you change both of your drivers in the car, which has happened a few times with that 19 car, uh, then you have to serve extra time in the pit lane. They still bounce back to get a podium as well. And uh, great stuff then from the American in the American car here at uh, Brands Hatch, which does itself host a round of the Euro NASCAR Championship so you'll almost feel at home. And we're going to get another podium appearance now, are we? And uh, Fastest lap of the race, I think, for Callum McLeod. It which... will be, there you go. And uh, that's rather nice, isn't it, as well? He set the fastest lap 126.525, which was about three or four tenths quicker than anyone else managed as well. Uh, Bit of a tricky season for them this year. You know, GT4, by the way, the fastest lap goes to HHC Motorsport, as you can see. Uh, but yeah, Callum McLeod and Ian Loggie, a bit of a tricky season, a bit of a tricky race, really. But at least they get to salvage something along with their 10th place finish. But they are now no longer in contention for the GT3 Championship. So I think that is uh, it with our podium presentations. Andy J hasn't won the race, don't worry. There isn't a, a trophy for him, but I think he's possibly going to try and have a word with our GT4 winners um, who hopefully have composed themselves and can think of the right words to say because in the immediate aftermath of winning your first ever race, I'm sure the mind gets a little bit jumbled. But um, yeah, they have finally got themselves that race victory. Andy, I bet they're pretty pleased with that. Well, obviously happier than I am, Andy, if you told me that I just didn't win the race. Mortified. Um, lads, it turns out you did. Thrilled, I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, it's been a long time coming. Um, it's just the past three races now. We've led nearly every single lap, and um, I think that's a credit to, to the team and, and how good the McLaren is at the moment. But, yeah, it's nice to finally finish a race and, and you know, take the win as well, which, uh, like I said, it's been a long time coming. We had a chat in the midway point. You were pretty confident then, weren't you? Yeah, I had, uh, I had all the faith in James and in the car. Obviously, the car's been absolutely awesome, especially for the past three rounds. And um, we've been showing showing the pace and knocking on the door. And I, hope, I, was, I was just praying that hopefully the door would open one day and we'd get the win and finally cross the line in the lead, which uh, we've finally managed to do. So, yeah, absolutely over the moon. James, what does this mean to you? Are you because uh, you're quite a calm and collected fella externally? Are you are you roaring inside? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there'll be a few celebrations tonight, that's for sure. But um, yeah, like I said, I mean, it's it's nice that once we have finally had just a little bit of um, a little bit of luck and just well, really, the bad luck's just gone away for for a change. That straight away we're, we're winning races like we've shown that we can do. So. Yeah, it's, um, this is the calm face. Later on will be the excited face. <laughs> I know that Joe Osborne's hanging out to be invited to that celebration party because he's quite the fun boy, but uh, he's welcome, isn't he? Um, Maybe not. <laughs> not to worry. We'll, we'll relay the, the news. On the TV he's a big fan. Don't worry. <laughs> um, no, well done, guys. It's uh, excellent to see you on the top step. Congratulations. Yeah, Thank you very much. Happy days. Well done, lads. Um, Andy, Joe, I guess it's uh, back to you to wrap up from what has been a remarkable couple of hours here at Brands Hatch. It wasn't bad, was it? I think I can speak for both of us and say we rather enjoyed that, Joe. I mean, it sets us up perfectly for the Donington decider now, doesn't it, in both GT3 and GT4. It may in some ways struggle to live up to this race in, in many ways, but Donington does have this habit, doesn't it, of producing great racing and dramatic championship deciders. And in what has been, I think, the most competitive season of British GT we've had for a long, long time, I, I just can't wait. I can't either. I mean, the tensions will be higher, so everyone kind of tenses up, but you've got to just give it everything. If you want to win that championship in your contention, there's going to be no shall I, shan't I. It's going to be, I'm going to send it, and if I take him out, then so be it, because I wouldn't have won the championship anyway. Well, if that doesn't whet your appetite, then I don't know what will. Be sure to join us at Donington Park in a few weeks' time for what is set to be a cracking two hours of racing to decide the outcome of the 2019 British GT Championship. From now, though, from Joe Osborne and myself, Andy McEwen, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.